The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. <laughs> Ever get the feeling you've been cheated? <laughs> it's Thursday, August 1st. I'm sorry. 2019, I'm Michael Brooks on a Michael Thursday. This is the five-time award-winning majority report. Wow. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal. And the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On today's program, Professor Gene Bajlan, professor of history at Missouri State University. What's happening in Turkey? Erdogan, really the original of the modern oligarch, of the modern autocrat trend, signs of resistance, signs of breakthrough. Bernie Sanders pushing the dial in foreign policy will get a perspective on how the Democrats are talking about the world as well. Debate night last night. Who yeesh boy. That was depressing. Shaky performances from the two front runners, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. Points scored by others. We'll get to that. CIA claims it has killed Osama bin Laden's son. A landmark and crucial arms treaty is set to implode as the Pentagon moves aggressively towards uh, testing new weapon systems. That has been in the works for a while. President Rouhani slams the United States over its childish sanctions that they've placed on Iranian Foreign Minister Jawad Zarif. HUD proposes more hurdles to provide to prove housing discrimination. Senator Josh Hawley, we're going to have to figure this guy out. He's on a crusade against big tech. It's not really about breaking up monopolies or making them public goods. It's about actually controlling your behavior. Making them fast. Incredibly, (laughs) incredible. The type of violation of your personal discretion that makes even a good, thorough, growing democratic socialist blush. Of course, we are, in fact, pro-liberty in reality. Fed draws a rebuke from Trump after the rate cut. Arizona sues the Sackler family. Protests across uh, Brazil in solidarity with Glenn Greenwald as clown fascist leader has threatened to throw Greenwald and... Members of the Intercept Brazil in prison for revealing this extensive corruption of the car wash investigation that made Lula da Silva a political prisoner and helped lead to the rise of fascism in Brazil at the same time that aggressive assaults on the Amazon and indigenous communities are taking place in Brazil. In Colombia, there are movements there for indigenous rights taking place as well and the democratic second debate sees a significant ratings decrease and if you thought jeffrey epstein couldn't get any more disturbing well of course you didn't think that and he does get more and more disturbing um all that and more on today's majority report i'll just say for those who were wondering why i was like unable to stop laughing in the beginning it's because matt's opening interstitial with sound drop is one of the most unbelievable juxtapositions i've heard in my life and it's 
absolutely hilarious, and I basically wish that we could just end the show early and listen to that. Maybe. Awful nominee. I live in California, a safe state, so I pulled the lever for Jill Stein, not just for Whoa. myself, but for them and for this country. So I want you to say to me that I was wrong. So melodramatic, but but I'm saying in the audio version, you were playing Fila Kuti with that. Uh, it was uh, the, the Don, was the Don Isaac Ezekiel combination. Is some good playing. Nigerian high life. You were though. playing some Nigerian high life music. I thought it was Fela. Oh my God. The majority report keeping you from crying in your car. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Pulling the lever for this country. <laughs> oh my God. More on that later. Yeah, speaking of pulling the lever for this country, Joe Biden, um, he talked about TPP last night. And I just want to say here, it's very important to remember that Bill Clinton, Barack Obama, every single Conserv uh, corporate Democrat who has promoted trade deals, which are really simple. They're not free trade deals. They are corporate bureaucracy deals. Particularly TPP was condemned as one, but one of multiple examples, but I'll just focus on this one for the moment. International medical activists, because it would have um, been a direct threat to generic drugs and readily accessible drugs uh, for underdeveloped countries. That was one area it would have cost a lot of lives. The investor dispute mechanism is an anti-democratic mechanism that would uh, basically override nation states' ability to legislate environmental labor protections in favor of whatever a corporation demanded, whether it was a bank, pharmaceutical company, tobacco company, tech industry. And every single time a Democrat says that they're proposing a new time of trade agreement or backing a new kind of trade agreement. Bill Clinton said NAFTA would have unparalleled environmental and labor standards. It did not. It led to a proliferation of sweatshops, environmental pollution. Uh, it, it was actually great for cartel trafficking, was a huge breakthrough uh, in how drugs are moved into this country, and it lost a fair amount of blue-collar jobs. Uh, TPP also, and Barack Obama used the exact same rhetoric. So Joe Biden here is pretending, even though he fought his heart out along while he was vice president, for TPP, even though it was anti-public health, anti-worker, anti-environment, he's pretending now that he would support something different by resorting to the same rhetoric that Democrats that try to sell these awful deals have always resorted to. Let's take a look from last night. Vice President Biden, just to be clear, would you or would you not rejoin the TPP, yes or no? I would not rejoin the TTP as it was initially put forward. I would insist that we renegotiate pieces of that with the Pacific nations that we had in South America and, and North America so that we could bring them together to hold China accountable for the rules of us setting the rules of the road as to how trade should be conducted. Otherwise, they're gonna do exactly what they're doing, fill the vacuum, and run the and run the table. So again, this means extremely little. Um, as far as it being a counterweight to China, that's the prime way TPP is stole, uh, sold from a geostrategic standpoint. And there's two ways of answering this. One, of course, from a worker, normal person perspective, you are not in competition with China. In fact, there are some very significant overlapping interests between working people in both countries and working people internationally, obviously. Everybody, regardless of conditions, wants to get paid better, have more power over their own work lives. The other dynamic here is that, you know, China and the United States uh, obviously have had for uh, quite some time now a reciprocal relationship where you basically exchange uh, cheap sweatshop labor for incredibly cheap products. That dynamic is changing. I mean, China is now uh, certainly a power in its own right and only going to get more so. That's just reality. I'm a big critic of many aspects of the Chinese model and foreign policy, obviously. And they've also lifted a lot of people out of poverty. And they are going to reassert their role in the world. It's a historic anomaly and oddity that China has not played a more significant role in the past couple of years. 
Um, that bodes very badly in some areas. Uh, it bodes well in others, potentially. So that kind of rhetoric, though, of containing China and getting serious about IP and all of these types of things. First of all, the United States has a reciprocal relationship, obviously, between Silicon Valley and the defense establishment and so on. So that's one thing. So if you want to really deal with China and these more sort of geostrategic questions, there needs to be things like a Geneva Convention on how we deal with technology, how we deal with hacking and drones and all of these other types of issues. But, you know, the geostrategic concerns of a very narrow set of interest is antithetical in the TPP to the lived concerns of people who work across Asia, people who need medicine, and everybody who breathes on the planet. This is Joe Biden, 2013, loving TPP. The Trans-Pacific Partnership is perhaps the most ambitious. He said the TTP in the last clip, and he can't say I think it in this it's, clip I either. think the TTP is a, was the European version. Uh, TTIP or something like that? T -T yeah, I think I so. Know. I could be wrong, right. but I think he's making a, a, some type of mistake like that. The Trans-Pacific Partnership is perhaps the most ambitious trade negotiation underway in the world. It will break new ground on important issues from the challenges of state-owned enterprises to ensuring the free flow of data across borders, to enhancing regional supply chains, to ensuring transparency and cutting red tape. We're also working to strengthen protections for labor and the environment. We Americans, we welcome competition. It's stamped into our DNA. It is not a problem. And what we're talking about is shaping a new standard that can become the metric by which all future trade agreements are measured. You know the genuine competition pushes our companies and our people. Stunning that he would say the free flow of information when one of the prime aspects of this is an incredibly restrictive intellectual property regime, which would, you know, if you want, yes, it would. That's what Hollywood wants in terms of bootlegging movies. That's free trade. Is that's it? right. That's free trade. Is making sure that uh, there aren't bootlegs in a market in Shanghai, sure, whatever. And then, far more seriously, you're talking about IP laws that will protect pharmaceutical companies at the expense of global public health. You go back to the late 1990s, and the Clinton administration had to reverse themselves on this because Al Gore was getting protested at every single event by activists when he was running for president. The South African government, starting to recognize in the late 90s the scale and scope of the emerging AIDS crisis, wanted to deal with generic drugs as part of their solution. The Clinton administration, at the behest of the pharmaceutical industry, threatened extreme sanctions on South Africa. And that's another great example. I mean, I, I don't have time, obviously, to get into the controversies around Tabo and Becky and South Africa and AIDS, but just even consider that element of the story that has been so de-emphasized while there's been these kind of single focus on a particular leader's views of the science, which are wrong views, but that's the bigger context. So you're talking about that type of enforcement for a whole range of drugs across the globe under TPP. It's a fundamentally anti-worker bill, a fundamentally anti-public health bill, and he obviously is not talking about doing anything different. I mean, this is a very Trump move almost. This is just, just call it something different. It's going to be great. You're gonna it's going to be it. great. You're going to love it. So uh, Joe Biden continues his non, I, I guess not even devolution, just his stasis. Mendacity. His mendacity. The 1985 Democratic Leadership Council energy. Uh, and it's not good for you folks. Not good. And also... And I say this as somebody who, again, it's like, I disagreed with Sam. I don't think him saying, don't be too hard on me, kid. I think, frankly, a lot of people find that kind of charming. I don't, like, you can't go after him on every single thing when you talk to a broader base of people. But I am becoming increasingly concerned watching him debate that, like, this guy is just absolutely not up for this. Like, on the substance and also on, like, he's not up for this. <laughs> like... He's looking very bad up there, and I'm starting to get quite concerned about the idea of the guy being on a stage with Donald Trump. Um, 
you know what the problem keeping so many businesses from knowing their numbers, Brendan? Mm, I don't know. It's so funny because earlier this morning you said it's their hodgepodge of business systems. And I said, you're exactly right. They have one system for accounting, another system for, for sales, another for inventory, and so on. It's just a big, inefficient mess that takes up too much time and too many resources and that hurts the bottom line. Introducing NetSuite by Oracle, the business management software that handles every aspect of your business in an easy-to-use cloud platform and gives you visibility and gives you the visibility and control you need to grow. NetSuite, you save time, money, and unneeded headaches for managing sales, finance, accounting, order, and HR instantly right from your desktop or phone. That's why NetSuite is the world's number one cloud business system. And right now, NetSuite is offering you valuable insights with a free guide, seven key strategies to grow your profits at netsuite.com slash majority. That's netsuite.com slash majority to download your free guide, seven key strategies to grow your profits. Netsuite.com slash majority link on the homepage. And uh, I'm excited to hear back from uh, folks at Credo. Majority Reports had a long relationship. Do you stand for the rights? Let me start. Sorry. Do you stand for women's rights and for the environment? There's a company that stands with you. That's Credo. C-R, a Credo. Credo is the only phone company in America that supports the same causes you do. Causes fighting to stop climate change and protect reproductive freedom and immigrants' rights. Credo donated 150,000 donates 150,000 every month to groups like the Rainforest Action Network, Planned Parenthood, the ACLU and many more. While other phone companies spend millions to push through mega mergers and fund right-wing politicians. It is so infuriating to read what these other telecoms contribute to and the causes they push. You make, a cho- you make choices every day about where you spend your money, so make your mobile phone one of those choices. Switch to Credo Mobile now. As a reward, you'll get 12 pints of Ben & Jerry's ice cream. That's a pint a month for 12 months. You'll get coverage on the nation's largest, most reliable network, along with low rates and a complete selection of smartphones, including the latest models from the top brands. Make the switch today. Go to credo.com slash majority or enter offer code majority at checkout. That's credo.com slash majority. Link on the website. Now that's a sweet deal. <laughs> it is a sweet deal. I, I like that. All right, folks, we're going to take a brief break and we will come back with Gene Bajalan.
Welcome back to the Majority Report. Michael Brooks here. Joining us now is Gene Bajlan. He's a professor of history at Missouri State University and a contributor on TMBS. He's written in many different outlets that you can find, and he will be joining us on August 24th at the TMBS live show at Lincoln Hall in Chicago, Illinois. Get your tickets. Gene, how you doing? I'm doing great. How are you doing? Looking forward to Chicago very much. Me too. I'm doing well, brother. Glad to be talking with you. Um, getting a little bit of an echo, Gene. Oh, let me just fix this. Sorry about that. No I don't know why that happened. No worries. Uh, yeah. So we're, let's. So first, we're we're going to get to what's happening in Turkey, and I and I think in some ways it's actually very illustrative to understand Erdogan and the, the just really horrible situation that Turkey is in under his leadership in some ways is really the kind of first iteration of this Trump, Bolsonaro, Modi world, Netanyahu, Putin world. But first, I want to talk a little bit about the Democrats' foreign policy. Uh, they don't talk about it much, obviously. People don't typically talk about par foreign policy. And then there's, you know, the cliches and repetitions that the press pushes and you know is obviously funded by all of the arms manufacturers and all of the you know conventional think tanks in dc and 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 mostly people kind of repeat the catechism as you look at this field what are your sort of takeaways in terms of what's being put forward in terms of foreign policy and are there any particular bright lights or particular low lights? Well, I mean, I think if we look at sort of, I think it's what, 20, 21 people running at the moment, it seems the majority of them, um, the majority of the Democratic candidates don't seem to be sort of stepping out the traditional comfort zone of U.S. foreign policy. You know, there's a lot of criticizing Donald Trump for conducting foreign policy by tweet. But, uh, you know, that's not, you know, that's a style rather than substance critique. However, we are seeing uh, we are seeing a kind of break with the traditional sort of view of foreign policy in, in Bernie Sanders's approach to, to to foreign policy issues at the moment. You know, breaking the silence on a sort of lot of issues, breaking the consensus in Washington on a lot of issues. I mean, most recently, for example, we saw uh, on Pod Save America, Bernie Sanders, you know, saying yeah, he will uh, hold Israel accountable, especially you know, using the $4 billion that uh, the United States provides to, to, to Israel as a kind of leverage. So this is a really interesting sort of approach we're seeing to foreign policy. And we're also seeing Sanders sort of take, uh, you know, move away from sort of the national security focus to taking a more holistic approach to foreign policy. So uh, and linking that to domestic issues. So we see the uh, refugee crisis at the U.S. border at the moment. And Sanders is linking that to U.S. foreign policy in Central America, the need for a Marshall Plan and so on and so forth. And he seems to be really sort of taking the lead in providing an outline of a kind of progressive foreign policy that we might see. You know, on the you know, we, if we look at sort of left wing politics, uh, in, in the United States, we often sort of have this problem that, you know, people on the left uh, are very critical of American foreign policy, but don't necessarily come up with an alternative. It's important to critique foreign policy, but, you know, uh, Sanders is a really, uh, it's, a, it's a possibility that he will become president of the United States. And uh, it is essential that we begin to develop a kind of progressive approach to uh, foreign policy beyond just criticizing sort of the evils of European uh, of uh, American imperialism. And sort of, uh, you know, as someone from the United Kingdom, I can actually see a I see a parallel between Sanders' approach to foreign policy uh, and Jeremy Corbyn's approach to foreign policy, particularly with regard to sort of. Critiquing, critiquing Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. uh, calling into question the relationship with Saudi Saudi Arabia, and sort of moving beyond sort of uh, uh, you know the silence that we often see on, on the uh, relationship with Saudi Arabia. After all, you know, if you go back to 9/11, it wasn't Afghans that attacked America; it was Saudi citizens. So you know, moving you know moving <laughs> critiquing Saudi Arabia is extremely important and hasn't been done enough in mainstream politics. So he's really taking a lead on this, and I think that is sort of dragging along other people who are trying, you know, trying to fill that progressive lane in the 
uh, primary process. So uh, you, you're beginning to see Elizabeth Warren, who has, you know, traditionally, she hasn't partic- been particularly uh, outstanding on foreign policy, beginning to adopt some of that language that uh, Bernie Sanders has been adopting with regards to foreign policy. Uh, you know, you see Tulsi Gabbard trying to present as a uh, as a kind of leading anti-war person, someone who's going to sort of uh, take a new approach to foreign policy, o- although one might question uh, how, you know, how uh, sincere Gabbard's approach is uh, to foreign think, policy. Well, well, and I think certainly one might question Warren's as well. I want to, I mean, I, do you think, though, that when we sort of break out, and I think, you know, you could touch on maybe this, you know, the Biden lane as well, or in the Buttigieg lane of no change, um uh and and really why it's it's a problem that you know this oh i won't do it by tweet kind of bare minimum of you know not being trump is is you know particularly in uh, pronounced in what joe biden and pete Buttigieg have put forward but staying in the sanders warren Har- uh gabbard lane just to to emphasize a couple of things now obviously you can identify, you know, people, look, Bernie's cast votes on foreign policy I disagree with. I think several years ago he was way less brave and less willing than he is now to speak forthrightly on the occupation and the just rank, you know, bigotry and authoritarianism of the Netanyahu government. But that being said, and I want to, you know, take this in three, Bernie Sanders can point back to the 80s and obviously people like, you know, New York Times reporters who don't care about, uh, you know, anybody in Nicaragua and don't have a basic grasp of U.S. history. They can try to turn this into a bad thing. But the reality is, is that going back to the 80s as a mayor, he was practicing citizen diplomacy. He was strongly criticizing uh, the Reagan administration's support for death squads and juntas and genocide even in Latin America. He was also talking quite eloquently about how the World Bank and IMF works for Western financial institutions, right? So on. In the warrant, and so there is this through line, and obviously, of course, I would mention the fact that he's the only pre- candidate to call for freeing Lula da Silva as an example. So that, you know, even though Julian Castro has also echoed some of the same rhetoric about Central America, uh, there's infinitely more credibility and history in the Sanders case. In Warren's case, and Mehdi Hassan made this point recently, we know that her foreign policy up until re- very recently has just been, t- you know, very conventional, uh, even to the right, right? She's voted for extreme military uh, increases. She's defended even Israel's, uh, you know, truly uh, uh, brutal uh, killing of civilians in Gaza in 2014. That was so brutal that even Joe Scarborough called it out. Uh, And now, yes, there's been some slight following Sanders. There's been some slight change in rhetoric, but Hassan kind of pointed out, but what about on a staffing level, right? I mean, Elizabeth, if, if you don't have any indication that this is something that a candidate really cares about and thinks about, and that actually foreign policy is something that a presidential, that a president has the most autonomy and power over, which is a problem in and of itself, but that's the way things are, that having somebody who basically will probably go back to convention is a big problem, just even on a kind of, staffing and intellectual assumption level. And then, in you know, in Gabbard's case, look, I think on one level, it's fair to say, okay, you know, you know, people in Venezuela don't care about the philosophical intricacies of somebody. They just want to know that you oppose a coup and fair enough and credit to her for doing that. But when you say sincerity, I'm assuming you're talking about things like drones. You're talking about things like, look, the Assad meeting, there's no doubt that it's being used by people like Kamala Harris in a profoundly insincere and smearing way. But that being said, there is a difference between opposing military action in Syria and being willing to meet with Assad, which I don't have an objection to, versus uh, maybe the trip was questionable in how it was conducted. Maybe you want to do diplomacy with Assad but you still acknowledge that obviously Assad has slaughtered hundreds of thousands of people. And part of diplomacy is you work with people who have blood on their hands. 
So that's maybe why there's some questions. So I guess in three parts, Sanders' history going in terms of citizen diplomacy and more credibility, Warren's problem in terms of kind of staffing and ideological assumptions, and then what really the Gabbard contradiction is here. Yeah, I mean, to begin with, on sort of uh, credibility and plausibility, Sanders has this long record. And again, to make the comparison with the United Kingdom, one of the reasons people trust Jeremy Corbyn, or at least some, uh, you know, many on the left uh, trust Jeremy Corbyn, is because he has a long record of opposing uh, authoritarian regimes around the world, which sort of gives him, and, and uh, as well as someone like Sanders, these people, they have this kind of consistent record. I mean, no one is ever going to have a 100% foreign policy uh, agreement with anyone else. And nobody is going to be, a, no politician is going to be able to cover every single issue in the world. For example, a lot of the criticism uh, that Corbyn gets regarding Israel, and I believe that Sanders would get regarding Israel if he wasn't Jewish, is that, oh, you're well, obsessed with it. <laughs> yeah, he, I mean, at some point, possibly. But um, uh, it's more difficult to attack Sanders on, on, on that issue. But one of the reasons Corbyn, uh, uh, you know, I don't f- find the argument that Corbyn is obsessed with Israel plausible is because Corbyn was dealing with issues ar- around the world, including the Kurdish issue, including issues in Latin America, right. including South Africa for a long time. And Sanders has that same pedigree of uh, sort of, like you say, citizen diplomacy and being involved in, 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 you know, in um, fighting against authoritarian regimes in different parts of the world. So that is very different from uh, Elizabeth Warren, who, I mean, if we draw a parallel, let's say, with sort of the d- domestic agenda, Sanders has taken the lead on Medicare for All, and now people are following him. And, right. and, and I think when it comes to foreign policy, this is, you know, we can, you know, uh, Warren has moved towards Medicare for All after being sort of skeptical of it, and now she's moving towards this more progressive uh, kind of foreign policy. Now, of course, there are aspects of Warren's foreign policy, th- which I think are, you know, connected to her, her, uh, uh, you know, broader political outlook on the world, such as, you know, her attitudes towards trade deals mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and things like uh, things like that. But when it comes to, uh, is, you know, issues of uh, American intervention around the world, she has not, she doesn't have this long pedigree. And uh, I'm not an expert on, on staffing issues uh, uh, with the with the Warren campaign, but I would I would conceive that uh, the kind of people she would select for an administration wouldn't be too far out. They would perhaps be the left wing of the foreign policy establishment in Washington, which, of course, is better, I suppose, than having these far right uh, ideologues in office. But then again, it's not going to be a radical break with Sanders. We have interesting people like Matt Duss working for his foreign policy, working uh, in his uh, 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 campaign. So I think we you know, there is a possibility that you can have a real break from the traditional foreign policy. As you say, the presidency is, you know, in many ways, primarily a foreign policy uh, uh, position. And I think, uh, I mean, on a personal level, and this is my personal preference, I think Sanders's pitch that he's going to change foreign policy is more plausible than other sort of uh, uh, individuals attempting to sort of present an alternative to foreign policy. Now, when it comes to Tulsi Gabbard, I think on one hand, you know, I work in the Middle East studies field, and she is not a popular person amongst people who study the Middle East. Right. She, right. she is, uh, she's, she's, you know, a lot of people uh, don't forgive her for sort of, um, perhaps not work, working with is a little bit too, too strong, but you know, kind of giving time to sort of anti, anti-Muslim. Uh, 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 figures, uh, you know, being close with certain fascistic elements amongst the Arab nationalist movement, voting but, against know, refugees, yeah, voting against refugees. That's a that's another sort of black mark against it. Uh, there is a kind of weird Tulsi Gabbard cult where people are kind of trying to present her as a peacenik. But as far as I know, she has, you know, she's she receives contributions from the arms industry as well. Uh, not but, anymore, uh, but she had it in the anymore. past. Yeah, she has in the she past. Has in the, so, but at the same time, you know, when people go after her like that, well, you know, Kamala Harris has been very uncritical of Israel. I'm not, right. you know, comparing Israel, Israel's uh, to, uh, 
a sad regime, obviously. But, you know, we can criticize a lot of people for their very, uh, you know, problematic bomb Well, no, isn't, that's decision. actually really, I want to underline that. I mean, because again, I, frankly, look, of course you can't at this point, you know, all of the atrocities committed by every single, you know, from U.S. to Russian to Assad to, you know, Saudi faction, of course, because it's a civil war. But I mean, look, let's really underline. I mean, Israel's an apartheid state. We can't soft pedal that. And... Kamala Harris and Cory Booker and Joe Biden absolutely uncritically support one of the greatest travesties and abuses in the world. And it, it look, I, and this, and I always get, you know, the Tulsi cult definitely hates me to the extent that it exists, but that is a major double standard. I will add, by the way, Tulsi's also, <laughs> I don't trust her on, Iran, on Israel or Iran either, frankly. She went to the Netanyahu speech that even Tim Kaine boycotted. But that's a great point. I mean, if Kamala Harris and so on is going to uncritically support a never-ending occupation and siege, there's no grounds upon which for her to to just use this Assad meeting as, a, as an ever-ready demonization of Gabbard, particularly, by the way, when Gabbard makes very important points about, as an example, Harris's atrocious you know, prosecutorial record. Well, yeah, I mean, I think the issue comes like, where does the criticism come from? Because... You know, there are very legitimate criticisms right. of Tulsi Gabbard, but uh, some of the people levying those criticisms don't really have the strongest position to criticize from. I think that's a, you know, that's a really important uh, uh, sort of point that we always have uh, have to make. And I think, you know, Gabbard does have these certain right wing uh, impulses on certain issues. I mean, again, I'm not an expert on Hawaiian politics, but one of my colleagues here in Missouri State who is from Hawaii, made the point that, you know, Hawaii is basically a one-party democratic state. So, you know, people you know, people in Hawaii regard her as being kind of quasi-Republican in some ways. I mean, I don't know if that's entirely fair, but she's certainly, I mean, she's certainly not as progressive, uh, you know, as people, uh, uh, you know, people often make out. I mean, I, I, I remember looking up her voting record to check this, and again, you know, this, you, people should probably fact check this, but it was not significantly different from Seth Moulton's uh, voting record. But, you know, there aren't people going around, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, going crazy for Seth Moulton. I mean, I don't know if he's... I'm sorry, I don't know who Seth Moulton is. Um, and I refuse to learn. Uh, and then just briefly, because we, we'll get to Turkey in a minute, but just uh, it, it, Joe Biden, Pete Buttigieg, then we, of course, we have, I mean, and Cory Booker, I think, utterly disqualified himself by not committing to rejoining the Iran deal. When you look at that, um, you know, right wing conventional lane, is it, is that, I mean, again, we have to just set aside the idea that it will be minimally better than Trump. I mean, how disturbing is it that there's still such a broad consensus to not have any kind of real, really radical shift on military presence on ecological policy on you know things like tpp i mean what what do you make of just how conventional uh that lane is spanning you know biden to harris i mean it's pretty depressing and yes. it's pretty uh, uh, unexpected i mean the foreign policy establishment in dc is well funded there are a lot of entrenched interests whether we're talking about uh, you know, international lobbying groups, arms industry, and so on and so forth. So, you know, the, the fact that you still have that conventional lane is unsurprising. But what I think is kind of significant is that compared to, you know, 15, 20 years ago, it, it, it seems so much more out of touch with the, the mood in the United States. I mean, 20 years ago, of course, you had, you know, opposition to the Iraq war. Well, you know, you had opposition to the Iraq war. You had a huge mobilization. But the right wing in the United States was also uh, was very gung-ho about foreign intervention. I don't think that's the case anymore. And I think one of the reasons Trump was successful, or, you know, maybe one of the auxiliary reasons, was that, you know, he was, uh, rightly or wrongly, he was perceived by many people as being, you know, far less of a war hawk than Hillary Clinton, who was associated with all these failed foreign policy adventures in the past. Of course, you know, people people uh, often kind of ignore the fact that, you know, the, the war on terrorism was backed up by many members of the Democratic Party. Absolutely, one of the, I think one of the one of the reasons Obama did so well in the primaries was that he was one of the few people who had voted against the Iraq War. 
Well, he so opposed have, it. He wasn't even in the Senate, but he opposed it. Yeah, um, well, he was oppo- sorry. He was opposed to the uh, Iraq War. Uh, my mistake. But he was, uh, you know, he he, he was uh, against it. And there were, you know, and you know that's something else. Sanders was against. But they were very much out on the margins of politics. You had people like Joe Biden who were supporting uh, uh, um, the Iraq War. In fact, one of the reasons I knew about Joe Biden before I came to the United States and before he became vice president was because he made a lot of comments on the Iraq war. He's one of the, uh, his, one of his foreign policy advisors was uh, a Kurdish lady. And so, you know, there was a big deal amongst the Kurdish community. And he was, he was proposing breaking up Iraq into three different sort of regions to kind of deal with the problem. So I think, uh, I think we live in a different time. People are tired of the war and that's not just, you know, people on the, uh, <clears throat> Uh, on the left, but it's also people who are perhaps in the political center or or lean right. And I think that's, and, and so it's sort of kind of, where you have people talking about continuing the presence in Afghanistan and, you know, continuing these wars. It, I don't think it resonates with anyone. And I don't think, what you know, do you I don't make think of it's the big fact, What do you make of the fact, and last question, I know we still have to get to Turkey for a little bit, but what do you make of the fact that they still will talk about you know, the amount of troops lost and so on, which was incredibly important, obviously. And then at the same time, if you, I mean, if you totalize the war on terror, we've killed millions of civilians spanning activity across the globe. If you just look at what we've done under the authorization of the AUMF, which is, of course, another thing that still hasn't been reformed since 2001, why is it so difficult for these candidates especially with news coming out of Afghanistan and another sort of incredible increase in civilian casualties, uh, for them to just even acknowledge all of the innocent people abroad that our military action has, has taken from Afghanistan to Yemen to, to Pakistan to Syria to Iraq, obviously, but even also in the Horn of Africa. It's really disturbing. I mean, I think it's a political calculation. I, I, I mean... Uh, rightly or wrongly, I think they don't think uh, talking about sort of the cost to uh, uh, the people who live in those countries in which American intervention has taken place. I don't think that's going to play. I I think they think that that's not going to play well amongst the uh, American public. And that's going to open them up to criticisms of being sort of unpatriotic and and uh, sort of anti-American. I mean, whether that's correct or not, I don't know. I mean, I'll, I, on an anecdotal level, I'll give you an anecdote. Uh, one of the people I know here in Springfield, he's like a hardcore conservative uh, supporter of John Ashcroft, you know, funds the Republican Party. But, you know, one of the issues he brings up about the Iraq war is like, we killed so many people in, in, in that war. He'd been someone who'd been very gung-ho about uh, U.S. intervention and now someone who is a lot more reticent about it. So I, I don't know how, I, I mean, I don't know, uh, I think this is a political calculation, but I don't know how wise a political calculation it is. I agree. And I think that even, you know, we need to start adjusting our discourse to not using, you know, synonyms for, you know, killing civilians, waging war, uh, and so on. Um, in, in Turkey, there have been a couple of different elections in the cap, and uh, not the capital, but the main city, Istanbul. The capital is Ankara, of course, good old Ankara. What happened in these local elections, Gene? Yeah, sure. So, Turkey, the news in Turkey has, I think, been overshadowed by a lot of things in domestic politics and, of course, in foreign relations. We've had this crisis with uh, I- I- Iran in, in recent months. And so sort of Turkey has flown a little bit under the radar, but a lot of things have happened. So in March, we had local elections across Turkey, which was, was seen by many people as a referendum on Erdogan's uh, continued rule in the country. And what we had was uh, significant gains for the opposition. Nowhere near sort of a, 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 a major sort of overturn of the RKP, but some really important symbolic victories. We had an opposition candidate winning in Ankara, and we had an opposition uh, uh, candidate winning in Istanbul. And Istanbul is extremely important because it accounts for about 30% of Turkey's GDP. And from the RKP's perspective, it is a huge sort of uh, engine of political patronage. You know, you get contracts in Istanbul and you are set up for life. It's 
you know, it's a vast city. You've seen the city. You've lived. You you've been to Istanbul, so you kind of know uh, how ma- how massive that city yeah. is. So this is a really important base for AKP. We've controlled it for a long, long time. Just so, to be clear, uh, that's Erdogan's we, political party. Yeah. Yes, the, the the Justice and Development Party, uh, party which has you know governed Turkey since two thousand and two. So uh, these were really important sort of. Uh, uh, victories for the opposition. Now, these elections took place in March, and what we saw was sort of challenges to the legitimacy of of, of these elections. Now, uh, a lot of the news focused on the Istanbul election, of course, which the result, which was very close between the government candidate and the opposition candidate, uh, uh, Ekrem Imamoglu, uh, this sort of, we're talking about 48% point something to 48%. And the RKP took the oppos- uh, opportunity to kind of challenge the results, accuse sort of uh, the opposition of some kind of vote rigging, which was a kind of bizarre uh, accusation, and eventually force a rerun. Now, this was not the only place in Turkey where uh, where uh, sort of, um, the results of elections were overturned. I would note across uh, Turkish Kurdistan, you also had the AKP overturning electoral results and um, and basically imposing uh, uh, government candidates on those uh, on those uh, council uh, on those local governments. But what's interesting here, we also had a similar protest process taking place in the west of Turkey, uh, in the you know predominantly Turkish re- uh, populated regions of Turkey, which is sort of some is a kind of new phenomenon. So basically, uh, in Istanbul. The government forced uh, a sort of rerun of that election uh, a, a couple of months later in June, and uh, it was a, it's been a pretty heavy and vicious campaign. So, for example, uh, the opposition candidate who is originally from the Black Sea region of Turkey in, in the northeast of the country was accused of being a crypto uh, Greek, which is a kind of... Uh, a blood libel accusation in Turkish politics. You know, in the first round of the election, Erdogan was campaigning for uh, the, the, his mayoral, mayoral candidate, Yildirim, who was the former prime minister, mm-hmm. um, and using footage from the Christchurch massacre to sort of mobilize Muslim support behind, uh, behind the opposition. So it's been a really divisive campaign, you know, very much like the, uh, like the kind of Trump campaign, you know. You're, you're, you you have sort of uh, a, a political problem. So well, is there a way? Mobilize. Is that a good way yeah. of understanding? I mean, Erdogan's gone through so many different phases, and when I studied in in Turkey, there was actually a and it, at the time, you know, it was it was pretty conventional notion that he was like, I mean. If you were on the left, obviously you wouldn't like him because he's a right wing, pro capital, you know, very capitalist, religious conservative. And then at the same time, there was this notion that, like, you know, this is just like Islamic George W. Bush, and actually he's democratizing some institutions and so on. He clearly is an arch authoritarian, and he's an authoritarian in some ways that obviously just echoes Turkish authoritarianism. In some ways, there's nothing new under the sun, right, in terms of previous leaders, although he's escalated and enhanced things. And I want to know, do you... Do you see Erdogan as in some ways a precursor to this global rise of alt-right neo-fascistic governance? Of course, there's all these distinctions, but we can look at a world, obviously, you know, Duterte, Netanyahu, Trump, Bolsonaro, Modi, uh, Orban. Is Erdogan actually like the trendsetter and the only reason that maybe he's not as tight with the rest of them as he could be is because you know they hate muslims and he uh you know you know islam is the vehicle for his alt-right politics i mean i think what makes Erdogan a particularly interesting character is that he's a character who has evolved and his party has evolved you know when the rkp uh you know first came into office it was a genuine a genuine political party with factions and right. and groups within it and so on and so forth but you know, over the years as erdogan has kind of uh sort of evolved has sort of uh, enhanced his grip on the party so you know the first wave of rkp um uh, uh mps were members of parliament were sort of eventually removed and replaced with loyalists. So we've had this kind of bureaucratic uh, takeover of the RKP. Um, 
over time. And Erdogan has kind of moved with the times, uh, and especially as sort of the Turkish economy has become sort of uh, less shiny, let's say, and there's been gr- uh, growing economic problems in the country, he has very much moved towards this extremely uh, potent sort of form of identity politics, attempting to kind of like, uh, uh, and rather than trying to expand his uh, uh, base of support, but basically trying to, uh, you know, strengthen and consolidate his base. You know, there was a p- point in the 2000s uh, in the noughties where, you know, Erdogan was attracting the support of, you know, Turkish liberals, yep. right? You mm-hmm. know, people who, uh, uh, you, you know, people who, you know, may not, like you said, may not have liked everything Erdogan has did, but appreciated the push towards democratization. And what we've seen is Erdogan has transformed himself into a more authoritarian, dicta- a dictatorial uh, person. So in some ways we can make a comparison with uh, Trump, we can make a comparison with Duterte, we can make a pa- comparison with Netanyahu and so on and so forth. But he's also, you know, has his own specific dynamic in that he kind of moved away from being a democratizer to being a strongman over the course of his nearly two decades in power, which is a kind of uh, a, 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 an, an interesting evolution that we've seen. So he is, I would say, definitely very much a prototype of this politician. But he is also sort of his own beast as well. Absolutely. I mean, in, in a lot more formidable uh, in some ways, I would say. Is he weaker, though, as a result of these uh, elections? That is a very good question. I mean, you you know, one one reads things and, and, and you know, the, people are always sort of predicting the demise of Erdogan. But he still seems pretty pretty much ensconced in power. I mean, we had this rerun of the election, the, the local government election in Istanbul and uh, uh, the government candidate was was uh, beaten you know from uh, you know by significant margins the opposition went up from 48 percent of the vote to about 54 percent of the vote so you know there was that uh, sort of symbolic victory but in sort of in the second round of the election Erdogan kind of uh, sort of stepped back now there was some criticism from sort of influential members of his party are about forcing this rerun. But uh, Abdullah Gül, the former president, uh, uh, Ahmed Davutoglu, who was the uh, former prime minister, sort of were, uh, expressed their discomfort with the, uh, with the uh, uh, you know, the forcing of this rerun in Istanbul. But, you know, at the end of the day, uh, despite this victory uh, for the opposition, you know, Erdogan seems pretty powerful in his position, you know, in his position as president. It doesn't look like there's anyone able to challenge him. If you look at the total percentages of the vote in, in, in Turkey, you know, Istanbul is a big loss, but the RKP still uh, maintains about, you know, 42, 43 percent of the national vote, much more than any of the opposition parties. And if you sort of you know, add on to that, the electoral allies, the uh, National Action Party, the NHP, um, you know, Erdogan and his allies still have a commanding position on Turkish politics. So, and and since since the uh, electoral victory of the opposition in Istanbul, there have been some sort of positive developments. For example, there was this position uh, petition signed by academics, uh, where uh, you know thousands of academics called on the government to resume the peace process with the Kurds, and you know these academics have been purged from their jobs. And they've been sort of uh, ostracized from society. Many have fled the country. If you go to an academic conference on Middle Eastern studies these days in the United States, you'll meet a lot of Turkish academics who are kind of made homeless by this. Right. The Turkish Supreme Court has ruled that, you know, perhaps uh, some of the rights of these academics were, you know, sort of were uh, trampled on. Uh, but, you know, on the flip side, uh, when the opposition won its victory in local elections, we had the classic maneuver whereby the mayoral position was stripped of some of its powers. So, you know, so AKP, opposition. yes. So these are, they're definitely Turkey's Republican Party, uh, just like the moves you see in North Carolina or Wisconsin. So as a, as a final question, I actually do want to touch on that. Um, this, the Kurdish dimension a little bit more. We've talked a lot about the HDP which was an incredible breakthrough and innovation in Turkish politics. It was a party that was centered on rights for the Kurds, but then actually evolved into 
a broad social democratic civil rights party. It was connected with the social movement, the ecological movement of the Gezi Park protests in 2014. HDP's leaders have been made political prisoners by the Erdogan government. And I, I'm just wondering if you could touch on the situation briefly of the political prisoners before we go. Yes. So recently there was a ruling from the European Court of, Court of Human Rights, which has sort of condemned uh, Demir Tash's uh, 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 imprisonment. And, you know, the, uh, uh, the HDP continues to be a political force in, in Turkey, but of course it's extremely difficult. As I mentioned, you know, at the outset, you, you, you know, you've had a lot of focus on the Istanbul election, but not so much focus on the purge of Kurdish uh, local government officials in the uh, in the southeast of Turkey, in the predominantly Kurdish area. And, you know, at the same time, Erdogan has been ramping up sort of anti-Kurdish rhetoric, you know, from a from a position, you know, five, ten years ago, where, you know, Erdogan was trying to reach out politically to, to the Kurds, uh, entering in negotiations with the Kurdistan Workers' Party, the main insurgent group inside Turkey's borders. It's kind of... Kind of uh, conducted a vault pass on that and now we sort of have Erdogan constantly sort of warning against uh, the threat of the PKK we and we have sort of a, a ramping up of violence we have uh, Operation Claw taking place uh, uh, at the moment attacking PKK bases in Kandil which is sort of which is located in in northern Iraq and the civilian cost of this is quite heavy a number of uh, villages and civilians have been killed we have the ramping up of tensions with the Kurds in Syria uh, you know constant threats to launch I mean as, as you may be aware uh, Turkey occupied the Syrian Kurdish controlled town of Afrin uh, mm -hmm. uh, and now uh, they're threatening to attack uh, Kurdish held territories east of the Euphrates River which are territories where the United States has a military presence. So there's basically a ramping up of tensions uh, with the Kurdish uh, community, both internally and externally. This is playing to the nationalist base. As I mentioned, uh, Erdogan has made a political alliance with the National Action Party, which is a far-right fascistic organization in, in, in Turkey. So, you know, trying to win that nationalist vote uh, in, in Turkey means sort of ramping up ten tensions uh, with the Kurds. Although we did have a very weird spectacle during the election, uh, during the Istanbul election. Istanbul is a very large, you know, has a very large Kurdish community. People often call it the largest Kurdish city. Um, and so the Kurdish voters were extremely important in that vote. You know, HDP members have been, and pro Kurdish MPs have been elected from Istanbul before. And so in order to win our, over the Kurdish vote, they actually, the AKP and the pro-government press published uh, a letter from Abdullah Öcalan, the jailed leader of the Kurdistan Workers' Party, calling on the Kurds to remain neutral in the upcoming election, mm. which is completely crazy because, uh, you know, so many HDP members have been accused of sort of spreading terrorist propaganda. And then you have the government uh, publishing a letter uh, within the context of an election uh, from what they regard as, regard as the leader of the uh, largest terrorist organization in Turkey. Uh, and, you know, the interesting result is that this letter didn't work. And sort of uh, Kurdish voters sort of continue to support the opposition candidate, much in line with the policy that the HDP was following. So it kind of reveals some interesting fissures within, inside the Kurdish mo movement, sort of the decline of Erdogan's at least his direct political influence, if not his, although perhaps not his symbolic importance to the Kurdish movement, and the continued importance of Demir Tash, who basically embraced the position of allying with the opposition to sort of uh, give a defeat to the uh, to the uh, uh, Turkish uh, government. Jean so, Bajwan, I appreciate your time as always. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you so much for having me. You take care of yourself, Michael. All right. Thanks, brother. Talk to you soon. Come see us take in care. Chicago, folks. All right, everybody. Um, become a member of the Majority Report today. Or I should say, before that. Did you know that your phone can be a powerful, fo a powerful force for change? With Credo Mobile, it can. Because Credo donates... 
150000 every month to groups like Friends of the Earth, the ACLU, and Planned Parenthood. Switch to Credo Mobile, the, stand, the carrier that stands for women's rights, the environment, social justice, and so much more. Learn more at credo.com slash majority. That's credo.com slash majority. Folks, become a member of the Majority Report today, majority.fm slash become a member. That's how all this happens. That's how we stay independent and give you that real depth and content. This uh, is how we are able to um, hack Twitch and be able to stay up the entire night despite everybody else going down to sorry. the man. That was a... Well, sorry, folks. Sorry, it was a victory. Total Last victory. Last man standing. Last man standing. And it was great. Uh, on Tuesday's Michael Brooks show, had on Brooke Thomas and Celso Amarin, former... Brazilian foreign minister. This Sunday, Elaine Ku on an illicit history of Hong Kong. The you. protest, excuse me, I don't know why I keep this dyslexic yeah. of me, which I do have, by the way. Um, Elaine Yu of the uh, AFP, French Press Agency, talking about the history of the Hong Kong movement and where we are today. That's for patrons, patreon.com slash TMBS, and go. To the Michael Brooks Show YouTube channel. It is a fully humming, fully functioning machine now at well over 60,000 subscribers, over 61,000 subscribers. Help us get to 100,000 soon. And of course, become a patron. Matt. Uh, yeah, Literary Hangover. Uh, folks, you want to check out the uh, Pioneers episode of James Fenimer Cooper. It's really interesting. Um, also, uh, I'm building my gaming rig currently Ooh, snap. Um, connected the power cables late last night so uh, go over to youtube's uh the youtube channel literary hangover because that's probably where i'm going to start before i go on twitch so uh, check that out folks check out the antifada we will be right ra- right back after a brief break <laughs> you are in for it all right folks six four six two five seven thirty nine twenty see you in the fun <laughs> Alpha males are back, 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 boy, back, and the alpha males are back, back, just as delicious as you can imagine. The alpha males are back, 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 boy, back, and the alpha males are back, 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 back. Just wanna degrade the white man. Alpha males are back, back. I take all of it to my throat. Alpha males are back. Almost says what? The alpha males are back, 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 back. You are a madman! And the alpha males are back, back, back. I, 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 I am a total cunt. Can we bring back DJ Danner song, please? Yeah, or a couple of them. Just put them in rotation. DJ Danner. Well, the problem with those is they're like 45 seconds long, so I don't know if they're enough of a break. That's fucking nonsense. Hey, folks! <laughs> reminder! <laughs> I do not have Parkinson's. And the alpha males are psych. Fuck them. Fuck them. Fuck them. Fuck em. Uh, <laughs> Almost says what? 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 Have you tried doing an impression on a college campus? I, I think that there's no reason why reasonable people across the divide can't all agree with this. Psych. The alpha males are back, 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 back. And the Africans are black, 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 black African. And the alpha males are back, 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 back. And the Africans are black, 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 black. Donald Trump out there, doesn't a little party you think that America deserves to be taken over by jihadists? Keeping it 100. Can't knock the hustle. Come on! Fuck em. Fuck em. Fuck em. Fuck em. Fuck em. Things I do for the bigger game plan. By the way, it's my birthday! It's my birthday. birthday! Happy birthday to me, Jew boy! I am 
have a thought experiment for you. And the alpha males are back, back. Africans are black, black. Alpha males are back, back. Africans are black, black. Come on. <laughs> what? Come on. What? Come on. Someone needs to pay the price of blasphemy around here. I, 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 I am a total pussy. Pussy, 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 pussy. Welcome to the fun half, everybody. Um, let's uh, go to some sound. So last night, uh, it was a very, I found, I don't know what you guys, well, I think I do know what you guys thought, but say it anyways, obviously, for everybody else. Pretty depressing, dispiriting debate. Am I wrong, or is that basically the consensus? I mean, no, I thought it was fairly par for the course. I mean, what aggravated Which is me depressing. About- well, yeah, but I'm right? there, I'm I'm there already. Uh, what dep- what really angered me about the first night is how much it was basically like d- I said this on Twitter, but Delaney was basically CNN's uh, Guaido, and they really tried to force him <laughs> and make him a thing, That's and a he just analogy. got completely embarrassed. And I'm happy that that happened, and I'm happy that uh, ba- uh, um, Bernie, with I think Warren taking some of the, a lot of the flack too, yes. was able to like recenter the party away from those people. But it was so frustrating to see that attempt and uh, it's so nakedly n- naked an attempt and then they did the same sort of um you know republican uh, talking point questions which that's already becoming a meme now people are already sort of um post that already but well when bernie said that i mean that was a real and then uh warren echoed it i mean that was a big that was a that was a departure point, it feels like because they were doing that last night too yeah and they and should and do harris more of that. was doing that. they should do a lot more of that I'm sorry, this idea, you know, we have to disaggregate. Like, obviously, you know, these almost like fascist, these fascistic energy of people at Trump rallies threatening reporters has to be categorically condemned and rejected. But then on the other hand, this other idea that there's this like generic amorphous resistance that just encapsulates everybody that isn't Trump is wrong, destructive, self-evidently not true, and gives this weird thing where even as you know, Jake Tapper and CNN are asking these Republican questions, trying to harm progress and human beings in this country that, you know, you don't clearly say like, no, you guys are doing propaganda for the other side. And that Warren clip with uh, Chris Matthews was a good summation. That was great. And she held her ground on that. I mean, that was just, and again, I mean, it always bears repeating that MSNBC is still somehow branded as the progressive option. Uh, And, you know, they have, more bizarre fixation and hatred and obsession or complete silencing of Sanders than anybody. And that, yeah, I mean, that clip that we played yesterday, I mean, Warren did a great job. And I mean, my God, it's just a refusal to absorb basic information. And, you know, actually, I'm kind of uh, working myself up to in retroactively enjoying last night because there's certain things that are funny to me to right. watch just the way that the candidates themselves have to frame their attacks and their oppo dumps like joe biden for the second debate in uh, a row reminded kamala harris that she was a prosecutor yeah. and he was a defense You're attorney a cop. i was a defense attorney. and you know i mean we have a few other uh, ones where it's like de-, de blasio going after biden um booker also i i love the way that they all it's they all go into sort of their dsa booker or dsa joe mode right with like how they deploy opposition research it's right very that's funny exactly right the whole terrain has been shifted to the left i mean and none of this i mean there's a broader social condition set but i mean if if bernie sanders did not run in 2016 this would not be happening no nope. period full stop so if you support that agenda you have to, at the bare minimum, give him a massive amount of props, even though obviously, in my opinion, obviously you should be supporting him. But I think that, uh, yeah, just watching Chris Matthews, like, I know, taxes. And apparently he convinced himself, and I think Brian Williams, I heard, convinced themselves that, that Delaney had a good night. A lot of people oh, convinced yeah. themselves yeah. about that. Ezra Klein, I'm pretty sure, Nate Silver. You know, you know, the, well, you, you, you play, know. Well, of course. I mean, all of the people that have no understanding or commitments to the stakes of anything that really do think that this is a television show. Nate Silver's found out that noise is much more lucrative than signal. Indeed. Indeed. Nate Silver's going to join us. He's got a... uh, Is there any numbers, Nate? Oh, you're just totally making it up in your head just like me. Oh, D minus, uh, (laughs) C plus. What's the difference between those two? What's the difference? Can we quantify it? 
Oh, yeah. uh, you dash yourself on a uh, cocktail napkin in about 20 <laughs> minutes. So, uh, yeah, tell me about this. I got confused. You're a frigging egghead. You look like you're stuck in a lab. And somehow you're doing exactly the same process I do. I guess I'm a quant now. Yeah, I guess I'm a quant now. It's all pure bias, gut instinct, and corporate democratic talking points. Mr. Math Nerd stealing my shtick. I'll tell you what. I mean, it is great to see exactly... Like, Nate Silver is just a depressing and mediocre bagman for corporate Democrats, purely playing out his own biases with a veneer of numbers. And uh, because, yeah, I mean, he needs to. That's that's, you know, we talked about the acquisition uh, that that his website went under. But like. If that's all you got, please, God, at least give me entertaining, ridiculous Chris Matthews. Because I don't want oh, yeah. like the fake. I want the like. I'll tell you why, John Delaney did great. Because the first time I saw Tip O'Neill pass out the cloakroom, you just knew you just felt something. That was what John Delaney had tonight. Yeah, at least Chris, Ma- Ray, yeah. Chris Matthews might say something like sort of um, um, uh, irresponsibly funny, but Nate yeah. Silver is only going to say something irritating. Yeah, Nate Silver is never going to be like, "Oh my God, will you look at Melania?" I could barely contain myself. Yeah, and if he would, yeah. you just recoil. Yeah, right. He would just be like, oh. Yeah, Chris Matthews is a human being in full contradiction. It's not just some horrifying twerp. Um, all right. Let's uh, play some of this debate. And let's start with uh, uh, there were three different very solid punches landed on Joe Biden by Bill de Blasio, Tulsi Gabbard, and Cory Booker. Or excuse me, pardon me. Two solid punches on Joe Biden by Cory Booker and Bill de Blasio and one very solid punch on Kamala Harris by Tulsi Gabbard. Yeah, don't worry, Tulsi fans. We're going to play that, too. Yeah, don't. (laughs) How come you don't play Tulsi? (laughs) (laughs) Tulsi should sue you and not just Google. All right. This is, uh... by the way, I have no problem with that lawsuit. Anything that pressures Google, I am totally down with. Um, So total props on that. Uh, Google should be sued and sued often. Um, This is Bill de Blasio. And and I want to just say, I mean, not only is Bill de Blasio absolutely right about this, but this is important because, look, people, as I've always said, I think if you don't like Barack Obama on a kind of, on a personal level, I suspect you have racial issues. (laughs) But as a politician, the man was president of the United States for two terms. And if you talk about Wall Street jo- uh, drones, uh, if you talk about Wall Street, you talk about foreign policy, you talk about immigration, you talk about inequality, you talk about ecology. This is not a record. At, I'll be as diplomatic as possible. You don't want to replicate this record. And so Bill de Blasio is absolutely right to attack Joe Biden on deportations and be honest about what the Obama-Biden record on deportations was. This is the time to do it. It's Democratic primary. Biden, I didn't hear your response when the issue came up of all those deportations. You were vice president of the United States. I didn't hear whether you tried to stop them or not using your power, your influence in the White House. Did you think it was a good idea or do you think it was something that needed to be stopped? The president President. came along and he's the guy that came up with the idea, first time ever, of dealing with the dreamers. He put that in the law. He had had talked about a comprehensive plan, which he put on a lay before the Congress, saying that we should find a pathway to citizenship for people. He said we should up the number of people that we're able to bring into this country. Lastly, he also pointed out that we should go to the source of the problem and fix it where people were leaving in the first place. So he did to compare him to Donald Trump, I think is absolutely bizarre. But I don't hear an answer from the vice president. Right. I'm confused. <laughs> I asked the vice president point blank, did he use his power to stop those deportations? He went right around the question. Mr. Vice President, you want to be president of the United States. You need to be able to answer the tough questions. I guarantee you, if you're debating Donald Trump, he's not going to let you off the hook. So did you say those deportations were a good idea? Or did you go to the president and say, this is a mistake, we shouldn't do it? Which one? I was vice president. I am not the president. I keep my 
recommendation to him in private. Unlike you, I expect you would go ahead and say whatever was said privately with him. That's not what I do. What I do say to you is he moved to fundamentally change the system. That's what he did. That's what he did. But it, much more has to be done. Much more has to I be done. I still don't hear an answer. Senator de Blasio is 100 percent right. And the deportations were absolutely wrong, inhumane. And this move that any criticism means you're equating or drawing equivalency between Obama and Trump is dishonest, juvenile and offensive to the lives uh, of those people. And also, I just want to say, I mean, that, you know, pathetic weak tea to say, oh, I guess you would have said what was said in private later. Uh. Biden mentioned that he opposed the surge in Afghanistan, which good for him. The surge in Afghanistan was absolutely wrong and a profoundly cynical decision. Um, similar to the one word. It's very similar to the, the deportations. To the, precisely. Buy currency with a certain group of people for a broader aim. In this case, the military industrial complex and in the immigration case, Republicans. But, uh, you know, both cynical, both wrong in both instances. But Biden by saying he opposed the surge is in some sense having a pub, a private conversation publicly. I just want to note that because it was so pathetic and Cory Booker is going to hit him on this. This is he, literally right after the previous. This clip. is, and this was very well done. You can't run a whole race that is predicated on. Don't ask me any tough questions. I was president Obama's vice president and, oh, whoa, you're identifying a, a troop surge in Afghanistan or record deportations? Well, you know, I'm my own guy. Mr. Vice President, you can't have it both ways. You invoke uh, President Obama more than anybody in this campaign. You can't do it when it's convenient right. and then dodge it when it's not. And the second thing, and this really irks me because I, I heard the vice president say that. If you've got a Ph.D., you can come right into this country. Well, that's playing into what the Republicans want, to pit some immigrants against other immigrants. That's right. Some are that's probably bad enough. Though, that okay, well, anyway. that's excellent. Yeah. That was uh, Cory Booker had a lot of really strong moments last night. I'm not sure how much it will move the dial, but he was definitely um, on the strong. That, that, that debate can do nothing but good for, for him. And I think that, that it was great to see Cory Booker, of all people, debunk a tired neoliberal immigration talking point that endless Democrats and Republicans have echoed that if you're and you know desirable you can stay if you're not you can't this is a great way of actually looking at three different positions on immigration there is the overtly racist Trump Republican approach which you know why not people from Norway or not people from shithole, shithole countries right now it is absolutely not the same thing and a ridiculous false equivalency right and it the person with a phd could be from ghana the person with a phd could be from bangladesh nigeria norway jamaica whatever right so that is what he's saying but he is saying it's someone with a phd that's the that's that's multicultural neoliberal capitalism which is better than white supremacist capitalism the real answer is don't pivot people who may need be refugees or maybe trying to reset a life in the United States. We have a decriminalized, humane process that respects rights for all, period. And of course, that doesn't mean open borders. That, that really, I, the open borders rhetoric is really unhelpful right now because one, it is used uh, by the right uh, basically to mean cheap labor to exploit Yes. Well, it also activates uh, um, notions about migrants that have been really deeply propagandized into the American public. Um, and so I think you need to take a more incremental approach to, to getting there. It's, it's just not happening tomorrow. I mean, it, no, nobody. You, and again, if you want to make it concrete, again, ideas like Daniel Bessner's advocacy, which I am totally on board with in a long term of some type of broader America's union that right. move towards open borders. That That's actually how you do something like this. And I, I do support that as a long-term goal with raised standards, redistribution, and all of the other issues that you need to address. But in the short term, the answer is you decriminalize, you humanize and demilitarize the process. You observe what is already on the books in terms of refugee conventions uh, and, and so on. You 
uh, immediately make illegal the family separation policies. You, as I've already said, you demilitarize. And then, yes, you have a hemispheric approach so that you end U.S. foreign policy of pushing a drug war, supporting dictators. Honduras has a massive military base there. Uh, you know, that is what's driving the desperate human need to of people to get here, which nobody wants to be in a situation in. So, you know, it's just very important to have this clear, humane, progressive position and not get tripped up in all of these various different types of open or not open borders rhetoric. It's very confusing and unhelpful. And you need to draw a clear third lane between the ethnic cleansing and racism of Trump and Republicans and this, well, by golly, if you're here to start a tech company, we'll take you. We need to take anybody that needs to be here. Um, I want to play one other. Oh, this is Nira Tannen. Oh, yeah, Nira Tannen said, The GOP didn't attack Reagan. They built him up for decades. Dem candidates who attack ba Obama are wrong and terrible. Mm -hmm. Obama wasn't perfect, but come on, people. Next to Trump, he kind of is. This is my outrage, outrage of the day. And my outrage of the day is Nira Tannen calling someone else in politics terrible. <laughs> Well, it's also just so profoundly unstrategic and I ridiculous, mean, right? Ridiculous. We can't we can't inflate Obama's legacy like Reagan's was. One, like the parties are different; it's different mindsets, but it's also a completely different media environment. Like, right? I mean, it's it's Harry Potter. It's it's pure Harry Potter. And also, by the way, I mean Ronald Reagan partially became who he was because he and his political movement vigorously attacked the relative domestic moderation of Ford and Nixon. So it's absurd. I mean, if you're doing political analogies, Barack o President Obama was a moderate. So he's more analogous, not in terms of historical importance or charisma or anything like that, but he's more analogous to, you know, a, a moderate Republican, right? He's more like George H.W. Bush than Ronald Reagan. He's more like F Gerald Ford and Richard Nixon in terms of, his relative position to the other parties. So the idea that you can just sort of pretend through wish fulfillment that somebody served a equivalent ideological anchor is just a fantasy. And in addition to the fact, as Matt points out, in today's media environment, Ronald Reagan, who of course was a, of a massive racist and arch far-right leader, but at the same time, he gave amnesty to immigrants as he should have done great move should be done today do you think that that would have lasted for a second in a fox news alex jones media environment they would have turned on ronald reagan in a second and in fact by the way they did turn on ronald reagan when he did the best things that he did in his presidency which is presume disarmament agreements with the soviet union there was a massive republican uh freak out about that yeah and so this is yeah i mean this is just fantasy world to try to suffocate a necessary debate today i i agree that it's going to be hairy when obama's legacy intersects with actual real ongoing problems but the thing the 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 trade-off he made with the deportations trying to build up um goodwill with fascists is like this is a bit of a ridiculous metaphor but i think it might uh underscore how ridiculous that calculus was uh, when I was like a fourth grader or something like that, one of my best friends got a Shiba Inu puppy. I don't know if you've seen those. They're yes, really cute. they're very cute. And I really wanted one. And I asked my parents for one, but they weren't really super hot on the idea. So what I did is I cleaned my room as clean as it ever was in my entire life. And I'm not a terribly you know, cleanly person. True. Um, when it comes to my immediate environment. But uh, uh, <laughs> I, like I cleaned it. it. I like how Brendan's la Brendan is such a like... At least you're acknowledging it. The uh, the entire... <laughs> I mean, I focus on more important things. Um <laughs> Uh, but, uh, I, f I cleaned it, the, everything off the floor just because I also noticed my friend did that when they got the dog. So I'm like, right. these two things correlate. Right. Um, and guess what? I didn't get the dog. <laughs> so. <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. Oh, that's good. You're calling from a 610 area code. Who are you? Where are you calling from? Michael. M m hey. Who? Oh. It, hey, buddy. It's Mike from. Mike from PA. I Mike thought it was you. How are you? <laughs> How are you? I'm doing I'm good, well. Buddy. Happy to hear from you. What's on your mind, brother? Yeah, I just wanted to talk a little bit about that uh, debate last night Please. and the, the public option and the whole strategy behind it. 
and how it's totally baffling to me that no one's even commenting on the fact that like Bernie Sanders called that the insurance companies were going to attack him with the ads they paid for. But if you actually watch that ad, they also attack the public option <laughs> yep. with the same exact right. talking points as they were attacking Bernie. So I went up and I totaled all of the support of the moderate centrists that were attacking Elizabeth Warren and getting almost as much time as them and Bernie Sanders during the debate. And they have 2% of the support. Delaney's RCP average is 0.1%. And that and could this, literally this be a, like his extended family. Like nobody's voting for that guy. <laughs> well, the thing that's funny about him is he was the first guy to enter the race. He announced his run for president in 2017. And he spent $15 million of his own money. And yet he was being thrown to as if he was an actual candidate. Right. Meanwhile, Mike Ravel, the, I mean, he's a joke candidate. I, you know what? I, I, I want to say I don't consider Mike Ravel to be a joke candidate. He has because, more grassroots support than Delaney. Because let me just say this. Well, I, I think <laughs> I'm not. Exactly no, right. I just want to say I'm, I know you didn't mean anything bad by it. But I just want to say, like, I mean, look, my bottom line is, I, look, I think the left movement, anybody considers himself progressive, should just completely support Bernie Sanders. This is an unparalleled opportunity. Yeah. Uh, there's there's points for other candidates. Bernie's the best and a different kind of thing. And I, I frankly don't appreciate all of the mess in general. That's just the bottom line. But if we're going to broaden it out and if we're going to have to say like, oh, that was great that de Blasio did that and so on and so forth, uh, it's insane and demented that Mike Gravel who was a very good senator and has grassroots support, brings something different to the table, isn't up on that stage. It's actually really ridiculous. I mean, I, the value well, he has for the public relative to these jokers is, is just a, offensive. He isn't up there, frankly. Well, the thing is, like, he qualified for the debate according to the rules. Right. But they just kept him off. Yep. That's it. Yep. Like, they just said to him, well, you're not trying to win, so you don't get to go on. Yet they had John Delaney go on and sit there attacking the number two and number three in the polls, Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, respectively, yep. telling them that they're unrealistic, that they're lying, basically saying they're untrustworthy, cynical politicians. How is that unity? How does that make any sense? Right. Why is he up there? And that is the question. So like, and the people who chose the candidates go up there is the Democratic Party. Like they're the ones who said that this person qualified and this person didn't. And Mike Ravel qualified according to the rules. Yet he wasn't allowed to go up there and say his piece. I, that's the thing that I found most disgusting. Well, it's about disgusting it. and ridiculous. And, and I think also, I mean, isn't it clear? I mean, look, we know literally. It was reported in the New York Times. There were meetings that included everybody from Nancy Pelosi to Neera Tandon to Pete Buttigieg to stop Bernie Sanders. I mean. People like John Delaney are there to to poison a progressive agenda. I mean, that is his purpose, whether it's, by the way, for many people in the Democratic establishment or CNN, for that matter. And it doesn't need to be a conscious conspiracy. I mean, I really would recommend people read Noam Chomsky and Edward S. Herman's work on manufacturing consent again, because it's it's ideological bubbles can be enforced and formed without a conspiracy or even in some ways, conscious intent. And that's the whole purpose of constantly throwing to Delaney and even pretending. I mean, the fact that he's considered anything other than a joke is just purely the fact that this incredibly narrow slice of politics he represents is held by the elite of the country, basically. Yeah, yeah, totally. And I would recommend, if you want another piece of content, go examine the... New York Times, like, review of each debate, they're, like, columnists and reporters, <laughs> and it is truly baffling to see how people reacted. One of the reporters uh, said that she acted with, reacted with visceral anger when Elizabeth Warren called them Republican talking points. <laughs> like, that's, that's the paper of record right there. Right. Well, um, there you so. go. <laughs> Oh, yeah, guys. And by the way, like last night, we in the community did a little bit of stream. So, Matt, when you get on Twitch, it'll be great. It was on uh, our channel, Central Committee. 
We had a few hundred people stick together way into the late night. Uh, so it's pretty great. Awesome. Uh, so yeah, I can't wait till you get on there. If you need a moderator, hit me up, man. All right. Sounds good. A lot of calls from moderators. You know, um, you, Matt. thanks. You got- thanks, man. That sort of reminds me of this. Uh, we talk about ideology and basically like how it can operate even unconsciously. Um, this part from this philosophy tube video on Jordan Peterson, where he discusses he, it very. It gets to the ideology part uh, very clearly, I think. Okay. And somebody who's merely deluded. Well, you can't. So even though he highly values the facts, it seems like some are more valuable than others. And it's not clear on what basis he's weighing them up. Interestingly, this criticism is similar to one put forward by another thinker, Jordan Peterson. He and Harris agree on an awful lot, but one thing Peterson has pointed out is that there are so many facts in the realm of objective science that you need some story to help you pick and choose which facts will be relevant. Absolutely. Philosophers would call that story an ideology, but that's not a word Peterson (laughs) likes, and he has his own ideas, which we'll get to. That's... That's actually that's very well put every single step. Um, but actually, let's do this because this was uh, Cornell West, uh, the man I uh, definitely consider to be America's most important public intellectual right now, was on Democracy Now this morning, and he got to that bigger picture of even like the freak out from the New York Times reporters, the anxiety, the in embarrassing ideological push from CNN against Medicare for all. And what this really is, is neoliberal order is in a panic. Cornell West articulated that on Democracy Now! this morning. I think that what we actually uh, witnessed in the last two days is the ways in which the uh, democratic establishment, this kind of last gasp of the old neoliberal project within the corporate wing of the Democratic Party is moving toward a state of panic. The real vitality and vibrancy was actually seen the first night with uh, my dear brother Bernie Sanders and Sister Elizabeth Warren. And as much as I salute Sister Dolores in my uh, beloved hometown of Sacramento, that, uh, that, that Sister Harris, Senator Harris, is trying to play it both ways. She's a neoliberal certain parts. She wants to be progressive. In, in, in other ways, but it's it's going to be the consistency, the vibrancy, and those who actually have the vision. And so the old democratic establishment is beginning now to recognize the crisis that it's been in for a long time. And uh, it was it was uh, both sad as well as fascinating. It was sad because when you really look at the condition of the country, the empire in deep decline and decay, levels of poverty, militarism running amok, neo-fascism escalating with Trump middle class, working class, devastated. The last thing you need is incremental small talk that you're getting more and more out of the establishment. And so uh, I hope that the Democratic Party can meet the challenge. But in the past, it's had a tremendous uh, difficulty meeting the challenge when it comes to poor and working people. That's exact. I mean, I, as usual with Cornell West, I have pretty much nothing to add to that. All of that is 100 percent right. And but I think that that language, that understanding specifically of the panic of people who's obviously, I mean, you know, John Delaney's hilarious because, you know, literally he is a health insurance, you know, oligarch. He would be implicated personally by a wealth tax. So, you know, and, and the fact that all of these people on television, are, you know, they're asking questions. They are multimillionaires. They are, I mean, you know, look, they are not. Jeff Bezos. They are not the structure of capitalism itself that needs interrogation. So I don't want to personalize it, but they are certainly on the side of people who are absolutely fine in this environment. Jake Tapper's healthcare is not in danger. Jake Tapper's well-being is not in danger. So just this relentless devastation of middle working class and the war on the poor in this country has no implication for the Democratic Party elite, for CNN anchors, and any of the people trying to force this agenda. And what's incredible is that, you know, they look at Bernie Sanders with so much side eye. Again, the the, the profoundly important thing about this is that that is looking at tens of millions. That's looking at most of the country with that same contempt and confusion. And there's an emotional breakdown as a result of it. I want to... Also play this clip. This was important. 
you know, Kamala Harris has an incredibly disturbing prosecutorial record. That's just the bottom line. Uh, anybody who cares about redemption, restoration, racism, criminal justice, over incarceration in general, policing, prosecutorial conduct, the use and rhetoric of crime uh, and policies that jeopardize so many lives as a political tool have to be horrified by Kamala Harris's record, if we're being real. And I've always acknowledged that Kamala Harris has a lot of political talent. It's great watching her interrogate members of the Republican administration. It's great watching her interrogate Joe Biden. But if you combine the doublespeak lack of clarity on Medicare for all, the incoherence of the plan, waiting 10 years to phase it in, which will cost lives, the totally standard issue approach to any number of foreign policy and corporate issues. And there's something just so profoundly disturbing specifically about the criminal justice issues. And Tulsi Gabbard, who, as we always talk about, certainly has plenty of her own problems, was the one to do it. She's clearly choosing to attack Harris and go easy on Biden. There's a calculation there she's making. I do want to say, though, the fact that Kamala Harris, that all she's got is Tulsi's the one who met with Assad, trash. I will critique how Tulsi met with Assad. I will critique uh, not acknowledging that Assad is a butcher and a war criminal and all the rest of it. But this tactic of you have completely uh, laid me the rights and all I've got is that talking point. And incidentally, I'm an uncritical supporter of all sorts of abuses in the Middle East. Get out of here. Nonsense. Tulsi Gabbard did a great job with this. Now, Senator Harris says she's proud of her record as a prosecutor and that she'll be a prosecutor president. But I'm deeply concerned about this record. There are too many examples to cite, but she put over 1,500 people in jail for marijuana violations and then laughed about it when she was asked if she ever smoked marijuana. She blocked evidence. She blocked evidence that would have freed an innocent man from death row until the courts forced her to do so. She kept people in prison beyond their sentences to use them as cheap labor for the state of California. And she fought to keep cash you, bail system in place that impacts poor people in the worst kind of way. Thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, Senator Harris, your response. As the elected Attorney General of California, I did the work of significantly reforming the criminal justice system of a state of 40 million people, which became a national model for the work that needs to be done. And I am proud of that work. And I am proud of making a decision to not just give fancy speeches or be in a legislative body and give speeches on the floor, but actually doing the work of being in the position to, to jail people. To jail people. Use That's the record. That is the actual record. There were some minimal reforms that she supported well late in the game. She even was to the right of some of the national moves of the Obama administration on drug policy. This is one of the reasons why, you know, why I roll my eyes at the rhetoric of get things done, do the work, and have a plan, is because that's how it's used. I mean, she just had all of the travesties of her criminal justice record clearly laid out for her. And then she came back with, I do the work. And of course, the Don't first answer speeches. is, yeah, I mean, okay, first, of course, I mean, look, it's ludicrous. You're a politician. Every politician gives speeches. So that's just silly. We can dismiss that. But then I think Tulsi Gabbard just explained the work you do. And it was harmful in a profound and systemic way to tens of thousands of lives. And I was the attorney general is not an answer to that. So, you know, this is very, very disturbing. And, you know, we have two candidates in particular. All of them have bad records in, in various aspects. Even Bernie Sanders voted for the 94 crime bill. But again, in terms of reality, he at the time did talk about incarceration rates and imprisonment. Joe Biden bragged about it. Joe Biden was propagandizing and fear mongering to put people in jail for decades and Kamala Harris did it as an AG. So you have two candidates who are not only behind the curve, one was a national creator of the problem and the other was 
a prime enforcer of the problem in all of her elected positions. I just that just simply can't be ignored. Marion Williamson broke my heart on the first night. I couldn't believe it. She was right up there as my number two choice. And then she had this after, I mean, masterful job with dummy Dave Rubin. And then she just botched it with this very non-visionary and very non-spiritually freeing answer on Medicare for all. And, uh, but what I love is that she's adoptable in a good and smart way. And so here are her supporters and her talking about Medicare for all after the first debate. This is actually pretty cool. So she listens to her people. She listens to her people. Again, if we're not just like getting down to the business of electing Bernie, which I absolutely think we should, uh, 100% across the board, and that includes every single candidate. Uh, then Marion Williamson's putting in some really good work. She actually articul her p p her articulation on race and reparations was excellent. It's good. Although, what do you think about her dismissal of HR forty? Um, like I think it's one thing to dismiss it, but like to dismiss it and also say I have the solution and it's this dollar amount, which we all know is if we're being real insufficient. Like I just think like why does she? Ha it's her anti plan stuff again. I. I I, I am know. less triggered by anti-plan stuff than you, but I do think that, I mean, okay, if I'm defending her, I could see that saying I'm looking into HR 40 is a bit of a dodge from concretely saying what you're going to do. Right. Uh, on the other hand, you know, to me it's like, yeah, she doesn't really know what HR 40 is. Right. Right. Like, and so clearly there's a lack of, you know, preparation and so on. But honestly, it's like, you know, there are limits. Like even Andrew Yang, like Andrew Yang, actually Andrew Yang had a really good night last night, uh, credit where credit's due, except he had a, uh, his answer of promoting his pro-gentrifying nonprofit as a way of fighting racism, I think should give everybody a huge amount of pause if you take those issues seriously. But it's like Andrew Yang said something ridiculous on Israel a couple weeks ago. I don't even remember what it was. And it was wrong. And it, and it frankly reflects being a moderate New York City Democrat, right? Like it's not that shocking that he would have a bad position on it. And I had a problem with it, but it's like, even that it's like, do I, do we, do we need to do a full segment on Andrew Yang who will never be president? No you know, being wrong in Israel. So it's like, I don't know. Yeah, Marianne Williamson, yes, she shouldn't be dismissive of that bill. And so what? Yeah. You know, that's kind of my view on it. Uh, I, I mean, I will just yeah. say one final thing is that, and this yes. is not a shot at reparations, but I feel like if the woman who is um, foremost, like I feel like reparations are her, the thing that sort of sets her apart. Definitely. If she's, uh, I'm glad she's done this Medicare for all little pivot because if she was the pro reparations uh, candidate, is saying Medicare for all is unrealistic. I think that looks that's easy propaganda for. That's Adolf Reed. Yeah. I mean, look, everybody should definitely read Adolf Reed's critique of reparations. It's important, regardless of where you land on it. Um, let's play. Uh, I want to just do this, though, because this is a final indictment of just how unbelievably awful CNN was. You recall on the first night, and I and we didn't get to this. I might play this on TMBS next week. They, this is a clip number 11 that I'm setting up. Last week, or, or a couple, in the first debate, they got Elizabeth Warren into an exchange with the governor of Montana on a first strike demented elizabeth warren said what any sane non-sociopath would say which is that no i'm not going to do that and that is the correct position that's and that is by the way that is a super moderate we're not talking about deterrence we're not talking about multi uh, unilateral disarmament that is saying i will not be the first person as president of the united states to launch a nuke on another country they dragged the governor of montana into it he tried to do a hawkish thing about it it was embarrassing it was disgusting 
Tapper harangued Warren, even though she was right. Grotesque and all part of the rituals of toughness and promotion of uh, literally world ending foreign policy ideas of the conventional media and, and think tanks, apparatus and arms industry and so on. Bernie Sanders wanted to jump in on that exchange. They didn't let him jump in because they wanted to set Pete Buttigieg up to attack Bernie for being old. They literally had a, oh, we're done with talking about what could cancel human life to set up a cheap shot from Buttigieg, which Buttigieg did not take, which was interesting. Then this happened on uh, last night's debate. And this, by the way, was the only time that Iran was discussed. Thank you, please. You didn't talk about Iran. Please. We're on a march to war in Iran right now, and we blew please, by Please, Mayor, it. the rules, please follow the I rules. I respect the rules, but Mayor, we have to Mayor, stop thank this you very march much. to war in Iran. We're, we're going Democrat on, and we're going to talk about another subject. Mayor, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Let's talk about... I appreciate you trying to stop the most, one of the top five most catastrophic things that could happen in the world, which the Trump administration is trying to orchestrate along with the Saudis and the Israelis every day. But anyways, we've got a format to stick to. I mean, that's just embarrassing. The television format of pres- uh, primary or presidential debates is an attack on the American people's you know, it's it's info war, literally. It is literally info war. I mean, that is shocking and embarrassing. I mean, that that exchange of de Blasio trying to talk about war with Iran and being shushed to stay on format is, I mean, that's 15 seconds which can indict and end the whole system. If we were in a any type of functioning democratic civic space, we'd all sit down and go, okay, we need to get back to the drawing board here. How are we going to redesign these things? We obviously need new people moderating them. It can't be done on private corporate networks. I mean, my God, even if it was, I mean, not that PBS is much better, but I mean, it could be as simple as this needs to be three hours, no commercial breaks. They can interrupt each other. They can actually have an exchange. We're not doing, you know, trying to set up silly uh, attacks on each other. We're not beginning with an opening statement. We might have some subject area experts, whether it's in climate, healthcare, race, or international relations, and we're going to actually have a discussion here because and take this the is live studio ridiculous. audience out of it. Well, I like the live studio ones last night because of the interruptions about De Blasio firing Pantaleo and the immigration stuff. That right. was actually good, but, they're but in only general, good they if, don't help. Yeah, they're only good if they're breaking the rules of being an audience. Just like the candidates are only good if they're breaking the rules of the moderators. Um, you're calling from a 509 area code. Who are you? Where are you calling from? This is Ethan. I'm calling from Seattle. Hey, Ethan. What's on your mind? I just got a couple of things. I thought I'd call into my uh, my favorite Minecraft Twitch streamers to bring up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank anyone, you. Anyone else? Uh, oh, it was great. Anyone else is in Seattle today at... Uh, Six o'clock downtown on second. There's a protest against ICE at their headquarters awesome. right downtown. If you're getting off work, it'll be six o'clock. Show up. Uh, show these ghouls. You know, like they, they say, uh, Seattle's supposed to be like really progressive. Like, let's show them what that means. So get out there and protest ICE today uh, downtown on second. Awesome. Um, yeah. And then the other thing is, uh, my boy Jay Inslee was doing pretty good last night. He I did. I was pretty happy with him as my governor. Props to Jay Inslee. Uh, he good was job right. last night. He was right in contrast to someone like Tulsi Gabbard. He, as governor, he did come out ahead of the pack. And he, and he said, uh, you know, yeah, Syrian refugees bring to Washington. We want them. So he's been good on that. He's been good on some other stuff. It, it, it's not going to make like a debate sizzle reel, but I also thought he had one of the best hits on Joe Biden which was this climate plan. Yep. It was it, Nothing illustrates Joe Biden's complete inadequacy better than that moment to me because Inslee said, hey, you know what? Guess what? Like your climate change plan, it actually won't do what we need to do. It won't eliminate carbon. It won't, you know, pivot to alternative energy. And Biden's response was like, oh, yeah, well, how do you feel about electric car charging stations? <laughs> yeah, I, I got like, 500 electric energy? car. I got 500 places you could plug your Tesla do we, uh, after the call, yeah. do we have that so we can, because I would like to make a clip of that because I agree that let's get to that after the call because Inslee definitely deserves a clip and props for that. I agree. So my only question for you is, and, and look, you know, these are, it's tricky because everybody's got their own. I think in the big picture, I know in the, I'm, you know, in the big picture, 
you have to deal with capitalism. You have to transition to a post-capitalist thing. And I'm not talking about some type of super idealized you know, world. I think it will still share a lot of traits of the world today. But if you don't fundamentally go at the market mechanism, there's going to be elements of the climate and ecological crisis that are just simply incompatible with limitless growth mm -hmm. and that incentive, right? And I say this to say that yeah. one of the reasons that I've sort of not been as generous to Inslee is I had somebody, uh, and now it's ridiculous because I don't remember who, but it was somebody from Washington State who I, it was a credible opinion, and they basically said, look, the guy's state record does not match his national ambitions. Yeah. And I always, and you know, look, that's the case. Jerry Brown, right? Is de Blasio. A well, certainly de Blasio. And that's 100% de Blasio. I know for a fact de Blasio's, I mean, housing, gentrification, policing. Bill de Blasio as mayor is not Bill de Blasio as a presidential candidate. But even a guy like Jerry Brown, Jerry Brown's done some real work on incentivizing clean energy that's significant he has a mm -hmm. terrible record on drilling and fracking and he has no vision of environmental justice in fact in some ways he's been quite reactionary and regressive even as he's centered climate like no other frontline politician so what is jay inslee's record really like as governor on on ecology i agree with you on refugees and immigrants he's definitely stood out yeah. and he deserves more props generally in the race but what about environmentally yeah. Yeah, I have heard some criticisms of Inslee from the left about like, I don't recall if it was like a carbon tax or there, there was something at the state level he wasn't great on. I, I myself hesitate to articulate those criticisms just because I'm not particularly mm -hmm. versed in Inslee's state record, to be totally honest. Yep. I don't follow it as closely as I really should. Like, I have been paying attention. I do know those criticisms exist. And Inslee, like, he's definitely like of the machine. Like, he was the head of the Democratic Governors Association. Like, he's, he's like a Democrat in good standing with the party for sure. And like, I'm definitely a Bernie guy. Yep. But, um, you know, may maybe I'm not sure if I'm, you know, quite as up on his ec ecological record at the state level where I could, you know, accurately talk to that. Like I say, he's been good on other things. Like I, I noticed when he does good stuff, like, you know, he put a hold on the death penalty. Like, I think we still have the death penalty he's... on the books. Definitely is one of it's the just like as long as better people running for president. I mean, pretty obvious. Just him crowbarring climate into every debate is yeah. absolutely worth like a fifteen dollar donation in my mind. I, I would like that. to see him on the stage instead of yeah. Amy Klobuchar telling me that I can't uh, get yeah. you know college without a savings account, tax advantage savings account. I mean, that's yeah. another reason in which these yeah. metrics are so dumb. Like, I, you know, I obviously I wouldn't trust the Demo Democratic committee can't make these decisions. And we saw the total ridiculousness of how they treated Gravel. But it's like if we had a somewhat mature civic culture and, a, and an independent non-corporate media, you might just even have the capacity to say, you know, like, OK, yeah, Biden has no ideas, but he's the front runner. So he's up on stage. And then people like Inslee, like, yeah, you're just in the debate because you're you hold an important office and you're actually talking about really important stuff. And every other metric is irrelevant. Yeah. Right. Like uh, he he yeah. is the only I mean, I guess de Blasio to a degree, but it's very funny to me. Like, you know, you have. You know, Delaney and Klobuchar and Quick and Looper mean nothing, are nothing, and are simply irrelevant bag people for a totally discredited system. And uh, you know, Inslee. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Inslee's Inslee definitely. Yes, he deserves he deserves props. I just want to know more about what his actual yeah. record is. Yeah. All right, let's. I definitely welcome that sort of inquiry into his background. But he, you know, as far as Washington Democrats go, he's certainly better than like our Seattle mayor. So. You know, I, 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 I hope this at least is a springboard for him for the ecological portion of, That's of his great. campaign. So. I agree. Thanks, Ethan, for the call. Let's play this. This was also really important. Jay Inslee, who, again, I agree with Brendan. I think, you, you know, look, the broader systems, how you deal with the ecological crisis uh, is incompatible with the quest for unlimited growth. There's bigger things that need to be dealt with. And at the same time, you needed a candidate who centered climate, and by the way, a candidate who also centered climate, there's not a single time that Jay Inslee doesn't talk about taking on the climate crisis, that he doesn't talk about union jobs, that he doesn't talk about broader systems to take on this crisis. And he is the only candidate that is an elected Democratic office holder who's polling at 0% and not generating any excitement, 
who's actually talking about serious ideas and real problems. And I have to also just, by the way, say in a, you know, a very good natured way. I mean, to the extent these things matter, you have this innate repulsion from a Hickenlooper, Delaney or Klobuchar. Yeah. Inslee definitely comes off as very decent decent I was and very say, yeah. yeah a lot of decency and i agree with you and i think you know maybe in some ways the lack of flash is holding him back but this is true he scored a big point on biden last night on climate and again you know biden's lack of anything is a huge problem on human lives when it comes to criminal justice when it comes to uh, reproductive rights when it comes to health care when it comes to climate i mean how does this pretend middle way work? It doesn't. Jay Inslee laid it out. Would there be any place for fossil fuels, including coal and fracking, in a Biden administration? No, it would be, we, would, we would work it out. We would make sure it's eliminated <laughs> and no more subsidies for either one of those, either any fossil fuel. We Thank can't, you. we cannot you, work sir. it out. We cannot work this out. The time is up. Our house is on fire. Right. We have to stop using coal in 10 years. And we need That's a president to do it or it won't get done. That's get off I'm coal. Save this country and the planet. That's, That's what, what I'm for. Would there be any place? No, he's good. And, and Jay Inslee really, especially even at this point, frankly, because he's not a top contender, even regardless of the full extent of his record. And if right. local journalists and activists want to document it and help their own cause in Washington, that's great. For purposes of this campaign, he is absolutely... He's doing a world of good centering this. Yeah, like you can say it's just rhetoric. On the other hand, this is very useful rhetoric exactly. if you want climate change to get addressed because what happens is this allows someone like Bernie or Warren to go farther with climate than they would otherwise. That right. and he's positioning himself well for a cabinet position. Definitely. Where if you get a Democrat in and he's not head of the EPA or the Interior or something, it's going to be people going, what are you doing? Right. Also, just a fun fact, part of uh, Biden's uh, climate plan that he touted last night was uh, doubling the amount of offshore wind turbines. We currently have uh, five, so he would make a 10. <laughs> that is the most perfect. That is the most perfect distillation of Joe Biden. Contagious chameleon. Criticizing the media for using right wing talking points as the same type of work that liberal media does when the right uses that frame. Yes, and good. Yeah. Water boat from Kashmir currently taking an American history class. It's amazing the adversity we face in Senate and Supreme Court has occurred again and again. 1830, 1864 runs many parallels of today, except the situation was more stark uh, politically, but we know what the lessons are. One, don't try to uh, bring voters from the center right. You will fail. Instead, give poor whites good quality of life like Bernie and Warren. Two, take a few election cycles to... Uh, bunker down because 2020 is the only the, the beginning. All politics is local. Think grassroots. We can do this. Have hope and build some endurance because it will take a while. That's excellent, man. I'd That's also, actually really good insight. Thank you. I've got a friend of mine who's uh, revisiting Robert or reading for the first time Robert Caro's series on LBJ. Right. And I think that's important to go to. Uh, I mean, the whole series is amazing, but not because you need to learn uh, what LBJ did to fix the Senate, but just to realize the type of like structural reform that people were throwing out there to try to fix the problems that were the Senate and how apparent that was to everybody that like, hey, the Senate like probably shouldn't survive another 10 years and like lbj got in there and you know ungummed the works a little bit and got some stuff passed but we need to get back to that point where the senate and the supreme court and that's actually frankly was it booty who brought that up or somebody brought up the supreme court no it was somebody no, else that i can't remember else. i honestly don't remember yeah, I can't, that. <laughs> sorry that's guy. embarrassing but anyway good good job you was it julian castro no Buttigieg was open to reforming the courts, and then it came out with like kind of a bunk plan. Oh, well, that's right. Buttigieg's pattern. Like Buttigieg is very adept at the rhetoric of change. Like his foreign policy plan. I mean, Pete Buttigieg did a foreign policy plan, which was you know, and the AUMF, which yes, it's really important, but at this point, like we're eighteen years into this thing, right? rejoin the Paris uh, climate, rejoin the Iran deal. Like these are all good things, but there are nothing structural. There's no departure point. And I think, you know, from healthcare and everything else, that's Buttigieg's MO is give the feeling of a shit. Oh, it was Inslee. It was our boy Inslee. 
I remember this. Wow. Yeah, Jay Inslee, Jay Inslee points to Democrats' real of problem, Mitch McConnell. Night. Even if the Democrats win the Senate, the filibuster stands in the way of their big plans. Very. That was another good thing Inslee did. Excellent work. Excellent work. Excellent work from Jay Inslee. Really appreciating Jay Inslee. Unknown Kool-Aid. What do you think of the argument that Warren is the best potential candidate because she can unite progressive and central wings of the Democratic coalition, especially in a brokered convention scenario? Um. Uh, do you want to jump in first? I mean, I think that's why um, the money is more open to her because I think they're. I think they're. I think it is sort of uh, the last uh, bit of uh, DNC. Ro- um, I guess you know, like in ship a shipwreck, right? Like they're going to try to go to Warren because they're not going to go to Bernie. She's but, a lifeboat in but, some way. Exactly, but I, I mean, I think she might be a sturdy one. I think that first of all, again. I'll just reset this, which is that if you have a left position of any sort, and I, I don't care how you're cat- you know, categorizing yourself, but it, certainly, obviously, if you identify as any type of democratic socialist or social democrat, it would be utterly insane to not vote for the first viable social democrat that could get elected to office. And I, to me, though, it goes a lot bigger because, I mean, look, it is going to be a fight like hell for Sanders to get the convention. And we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. And I'm actually much more concerned about Warren throwing her weight behind Sanders in the case that he's leading um, and she has his back. That's a genuine concern. And I look, I don't hold... I don't hold Warren not endorsing Bernie in 2016 the way some people do like it's the end of the earth and it proves that she's really this and really that. Like, look, let's have a little maturity. If Hillary Clinton picked her as vice president, that would have been a very good thing. And of course, Elizabeth Warren should have allowed herself to be vetted by Hillary Clinton. It's ridiculous. That said, it's a big indication of a calculation Yeah. that in the Massachusetts primary, which was very close and was a lifeline that Sanders could have stayed on, that Warren chose to not go with a serious agenda and endorse Bernie Sanders and trim her sails for the establishment does not speak well of her overall broad structural commitments, right? So there's a dialectic to it. One, she's, you know, Look, I'm just going to be real. I mean, some people are trying to compare her to to Hillary Clinton and all this stuff. Ridiculous. Nonsense. Not her record. Not what she's running on. Conversely, people are trying to say that she is to the left or as structural as Sanders. Ridiculous. No. Nonsense. Not her record. So, sorry. So you have a, a person who wants to do a smaller, more limited scale of what Sanders is doing. The huge advantage that Bernie has, and this is the biggest advantage he has over everybody else in a general election, and the biggest advantage that he would have as president. He said this morning, I won't be commander-in-chief, I'll be organizer-in-chief, is that he has a movement like no other to go in and fight like hell to actually do this. Now, yes, Jay Inslee's right about the institutional blocks in the Senate, no doubt about it. But the bigger institutional block is that a handful of corporations and corporate sector own this process. We are in a oligarchy. Look at the Princeton research. I mean, we are not in a functioning democracy. And it is not because plans aren't smart enough. It's not because people haven't been persuaded. It's because of a pure lock on power. And it's very revealing that people around Warren have, even as they've branded the plan thing, they've had to pivot to the movement thing. But she doesn't have a movement. Now, you could say, oh, well, the movement still exists even without Sanders, and that's transferable. I don't think it's as fungible. I think the way that Sanders is running this campaign, the fact that there is an independent infrastructure around it, independent media around it, the fact that they're using their email lists uh, to warn about ICE raids, to support other movements and groups, it's totally unparalleled. The movement is in the DNA of the campaign. So that when he runs in a general election or gets elected president, there is a completely different infrastructure to achieve things. 
that is completely unparalleled. And then the other aspect, and people just need to, to grow up, foreign policy seriously matters and it seriously impacts your life. And there is no comparison in terms of dealing with those issues, which I've talked about extensively. But the third issue is what do we mean by unite centrist and progressive wings? Because again, if we look at the demographics of how this breaks down, Bernie is amassing a broad multiracial working class coalition. A broad multiracial working class coalition is how a Democrat wins. And most importantly, it is across the board what needs to be delivered on. I have no doubt that there are some people and people that are overrepresented in social media and so on who really are, you know, a, a Warren or Sanders, in which case, great. They'll happily support uh, Bernie Sanders because they're somewhere on the progressive to center left spectrum. Other people who are pivoting to Warren because of a a hatred of Bernie Sanders or because they have, um, you know, again, it's not an ideological commitment. It's a different sort of demo and profile, uh, you know, then that isn't really implicated much one way or another by who's the nominee, frankly. That isn't implicated. I mean, if Sanders is the nominee, the hope is, is that, you know, uh, people like Mimi Roca or whatever who have this you know, bizarre, irrational hatred of him that they will elevate defeating Trump. Just like, by the way, people like me who actually disliked Hillary Clinton because we didn't like welfare reform or prison industrial complex or the Honduras coup. We still recognize that we needed to stop Trump. So hopefully and cried people, in our cars. yeah, we, even though we cried in our cars. So hopefully people who have that weird fixation on Bernie will have the same uh, sanity and decency uh, that some of us had in 2016. Uh, and then, you know, if it's if it's Warren, uh, m again, most normal progressives would certainly, uh, you know, of course, look, I'm on one hand, I'm not I keep saying I'm not going to say that she is equivalent to or the same thing or in any way remotely being as good of or better than Sanders. Sorry, it's not reality. And then on the flip side, of course, she's not Joe Biden. Of course, she's not Hillary Clinton. Of course, she's significantly better. That's also ludicrous. So. If she was the nominee, there are those of us who would feel, of course, a hell. I mean, disappointed as hell. It's work elsewhere. Worried as hell that that uh, it wasn't Bernie. Work elsewhere, but certainly feel a great deal better and a lot more comfort that it isn't Joe Biden or Kamala Harris. So I, you know, stop hyping ourselves into these scenarios. If you have a certain politics, if your politics are on the left in any sort, yeah, Bernie Sanders. It's an unparalleled opportunity. Just support him. And if you're not, then support somebody else, but don't be under any illusion. I think, you know, that is really important. If you have a left stance that certainly includes any concern for the rest of the world, and I, I find it shocking how blasé people can be about that. Your vote as an American citizen literally affects every single person on planet Earth. And voting for every single military budget increase, including beyond what Trump has asked for in one instance, and being a loyal uh, advocate of Raytheon in the Senate, is a big goddamn problem. That's something for both Tulsi and Warren fans to chew over. Absolutely. Absolutely. And what I hear from Tulsi fans is a delusion and fantasy that doesn't match her record. And what I hear from Warren fans is not a goddamn thing. And that's a big problem. You can't run around talking about how progressive and everybody has a plan and this and that if you don't have any serious plan on the military industrial complex or foreign policy. But more broadly, if you care about everything from gentrification to the military industrial complex, you can't just elect people. You need to have a serious movement. Nobody understands that like Bernie Sanders. So, if you are on any sort of actual left, there is a candidate that's unparalleled. That's the bottom line. Who can win? So, you know, I just don't have a lot of time for all this other stuff. Yeah, I think it's as simple as that. I also think that with Warren, I'm, I'm really sort of content to take a wait-and-see approach with her because I did not think she'd perform terribly well at all. Um, right. She's performing better than I thought she would. Um, but also, I don't think she will be in the position to take the uh, nomination unless she's proven that she's a different politician than the one that made the decision not to support Bernie in 2016. Precisely. And that's a, and you know, and by the way, that is the type of thing because, 
again, let's be really honest about this arc, right? Warren announced, and it was ludicrous. It was ludicrous that people were talking about Beto O'Rourke and Pete Buttigieg while you had a United States senator who had a really important record on Wall Street and consumer issues putting out some incredibly solid plans. Ridiculous. Her campaign capitalized on that. They flipped the dynamic. And in the past couple of months, she's been in a pure media honeymoon. Now, though, it is important to say, well, if you're on one side of the equation, why, when you had an opportunity to shift the scales in 2016, didn't you? Clear as day on Wall Street, on trade, on banking, on credit cards, Hillary Clinton is just as bad, if not worse, on some areas than Joe Biden. The same, same candidate on these issues. Bernie Sanders had a chance. Why didn't you intervene? The, now it's changed, but there was a lot of equivocating on Medicare for all. I don't want equivocating on Medicare for all. Why was there not that clarity? And then all the military foreign policy movement stuff and how we actually do things. That, these things now, as the dynamics have changed, need to be really talk, talked about and seriously examined. It can't just be uncritical anymore. Um, because, to her credit, she is a top-line candidate now, <laughs> um, which is in many ways a good thing. All right. Uh, you remember how I would do impressions of Ronald Reagan being a bigot because um, it'd be pretty easy to deduce that a guy who denied the AIDS crisis and vetoed a sanctions package against apartheid South Africa and ran against quote unquote welfare queens and young bucks getting welfare checks. Yeah, that guy was probably a bigot. And now we have some archival evidence of the absolute Frigging obvious. This is a phone call from 1971 with Ronald Reagan to Richard Nixon. And guess what? It's Reagan saying all the racist stuff, not Richard Nixon saying his usual racist stuff. I will say this as someone who has read, uh, I've read more on Nixon than I have on Reagan. I think Reagan was more of a racist than even Nixon was. Totally. I totally accept that because Nixon could still probably recognize like, you know, like someone like, I had to get rid of Nkrumah, but was a darn fine strategist. Yes. And I tell you to watch that thing on television and I, as I did. Yeah. To see those, those monkeys from those African countries. <laughs> Damn them, they're still uncomfortable wearing shoes. <laughs> those monkeys from those African countries. <laughs> Damn them, they're still uncomfortable wearing shoes. Yeah, Ronald Reagan was a great American who really restored our optimism. We should all respect him. This is kind of a funny little uh, yeah. thing here. I'll, the law bo- at the underscore <laughs> law underscore boy law boy esquire. <laughs> if you think you're bad at your job, there's a Ronald Reagan biographer who didn't realize he was a racist until a week ago. We can go to this. <laughs> Uh, um, I'm kind of taken aback. Are you kidding me? Said Bob Spitz, author of Reagan, An American Journey. <laughs> In all of my very careful research into his private papers, I never found an instance where I felt Ronald Reagan was racist. What about his public veto of a sanctions package against apartheid South Africa? That's some good reporting, too. Like to go to a go to Republican the... writer really? or of, of Reagan to say, hey, you never thought of this? There's a lot of nervous biographers. That guy really learned from Reagan, though. You could tell, like, in my examination of his public, of his private papers. In my uh, heart. In my heart. I thought it wasn't racist. The facts no. say otherwise. The facts say otherwise. I always thought that Curious George was a delightful character. And I meant nothing by it to the great African people. A lot of Donald people, Trump is a nothing new under the sun, folks. And a lot of people today like to say they go out without shoes because it's good for their arches. Yeah, it's good for their arches. That's why those earth-gripping shoes are so popular. Uh, an important point to make on this about of national security or privacy. Uh, um, so I, I've listened to a lot of Nixon tapes. I've listened to probably that call, but... That was not available earlier because it was beeped out. If you listen to a lot of the Nixon tapes, 
uh, the first thing I always do is load them up and then look and you can see visually how much is just beeped out with this tone. Right. And it's a huge parts of all these conversations. We don't know half of this stuff. And this was beeped out for privacy of Richard or of, uh, of uh, Ronald Reagan, which can privacy, you please beep that out for privacy? Yeah, privacy. Uh, you know, privacy, public. like talking about a private medical condition or revealing that the governor of California is a rank bigot. Yeah, while the president chuckles along. You know, privacy. Privacy becomes a euphemism for public image. Indeed. Speaking of public image, racism. Let's talk about Ben Shapiro. And, of course, I mean that apropos of nothing. Um, ben Shapiro is definitely a, a little fella that loves Ronald Reagan. I wonder what he'll think of these new tapes. Um, Flint, Michigan is still in the midst of this crisis with its water. Uh, and this is nothing new. There's poisoning, a lack of water quality across the country. Of course, this proportionally affect people of color, low-income people. It's a structural issue in this society, and it is absolutely an issue of institutional racism. One of the really funny things about Flint, though, is I understand how in certain instances it takes like, I don't know, 10 minutes of abstract thought process to say, oh, while there might be as an example, local problems in Baltimore, right? I'm not going to go to bat here to defend local Baltimore institutions like the mayor, the police department, or the real estate developers or anything else. But you can also take a couple of steps back and go, oh, part of the reason a city like Baltimore might be happening, uh, having problems is because of uh, structural racism, deindustrialization, underinvestment in cities, brutal racist policing policies, and so on, right? You you think a few steps out, and then you can have a structural understanding of how the economy works, how race works, and things like that. Now, I would never want to burden Ben Shapiro or any of his fans to have to think out a couple of steps through that process. I understand that that's not very logical. He doesn't rep- give you enough time with his fast speaking. He doesn't give anyway. you enough time with his fast speaking, and it's much more comfortable uh, to just tell simple uh bedtime stories so that you don't have to actually deal with any problems or deal with our current history or current reality or history. But when you talk about Flint and you do this angle, you run up against some very basic problems. This is Ben Shapiro. Okay. So it's environmental racism, this kind of racism and that kind of, okay. Then Marianne Williamson steps in and Marianne Williamson actually makes a pitch that again is spiritual in nature and thus, when it comes to issues of race, is actually more attractive. Here's Marianne Williamson putting the slavery reparations <laughs> question in a way that actually sounds more reasonable than the way Democrats are talking about it. I assure you, I lived in Gross Point. What happened in Flint would not have happened in Gross Point. This is part of the dark underbelly of American society. The racism, the bigotry, and the entire conversation that we're having here tonight, if you think any of this wonkiness is going to deal with this dark psychic force of the collectivized hatred that this president is bringing up in this country, then I'm afraid that the Democrats are going to see some very dark days. We need to say it like it is. It's bigger than Flint. Okay, and so again, she's wrong. Flint is governed by minorities. I mean, the, the, the folks who are, the, the, the mayor of Flint is, was black at the time. Uh, the folks who were involved in the Flint water crisis were of minority descent. It wasn't white people cramming down a situation on Flint. By the way, they're all Democrat. But what she's actually saying there is more speaking to the heart and soul of the Democratic Party than anything that Elizabeth Warren just said. Elizabeth- okay, so that's interesting that he would frame it that way. I, I don't know. I mean, I actually do think there's a huge value in some of the ways that Marion Williamson is actually talking about those issues. And I do think things like truth and reconciliation commission and the reality, whether it's spiritual, psychological or otherwise, but the effort to simply force and get people to understand American history is very significant. So, and it's interesting that it's that even someone like Shapiro is actually sort of forced to, to, uh, understand that on some limited level but that being said we just got to get this out of the way flint michigan run by african americans huh in 2000 and and just let's be clear here flint's population is being decimated for decades you can go back to roger and me 
Michael Moore documentary about deindustrialization. In 2011, Richard Rick Schneider, nerd that cares, a, a t- one tough nerd was his slogan, forced Flitter Flint into state control. He set up a board of oversight and overseers, which had some diverse representation. And they implemented a brutal austerity plan on Flint, including the changes to their water system that led to the poisoning of the residents of Flint. It's shocking that Rich, Rick Snyder and others haven't been criminally charged. So just to be clear, in this specific instance, forget even the broader structural questions of why certain communities are poisoned and not others, which Ben Shapiro has no grasp of and no interest in. In this one instance of Flint, even that cheap, misleading, disingenuous, essentialist, and dumb talking point isn't even true. Local officials did not have control over their water policies, period, full stop. Uh, I'm going to have to shout out. Maybe I said that too slow. My uh, literary hangover episode on George Orwell's Looking Back on the Spanish War, because I think it gives insight into why uh, Ben Shapiro might like Marianne Williamson's approach here. Uh, He has this uh, toward the end. Uh, It says, behind all the balahu that is uh, talked about godless Russia and the materialism of the working class. And reminder, George Orwell, for people who don't know, wasn't a huge fan of Stalin's Russia. Um, Behind all the ballyhoo that is talked about godless Russia and materialism of the working class lies a simple intention of those with money or privileges to cling to them. Ditto the thought it contains... Ditto, though it contains a partial truth, like we said with Marianne, with all the talk about worthlessness of social reconstruction not accompanied by a change of heart. The pious ones, from the Pope to the yogis of California, are great on the changes of heart, much more reassuring from their point of view than a change to the economic system. That's great. He's missing liberation theology, which certainly has a change to the economic system. So this isn't, I mean, this can be a false choice. Uh, what Liberation theology, what's the like lineage of that? Uh, basically Marxist priests in Latin America. Right. But I mean, like, so they were, I mean, people like years? Romeo. Well, uh, fair enough. Like that's later on. Yeah, this is in the thirties. That's right? fair enough. That's right. later on. I mean, but he was, but he was he's all, okay. He's missing Gandhi people about, like Doris yeah. day who were, you know, and I mean, there were, there was always Catholic and Jewish socialist. I mean, Gandhi is a much more complicated figure. So, and I, I mean, it, so says, I, it contains a partial truth there. Too. No, no, it's all right. Fair enough. You know what? In the 1930s, this is a brilliant argument. <laughs> and you're right about why it would appeal to Shapiro. Um, all right. Jay Cole, Jay cool. Thanks for the MR debate coverage. I've heard some YouTube commentators talking about unionization for creators. What do you guys think about it? I think that that is very interesting yeah, and tell very me more. important. I want to hear more. Um, Jerry from ZipRecruiter. I didn't get that. No, it wasn't. Uh, it was some like Don't be going elaborate advertise. like advertise muffin joke. I didn't really advertisers are not suitable for comedy. Yeah, we do not do, do jokes. not joke about. We do not ever joke about it's advertisers on this show. They do a great job. Uh, book recommendation, Pedagogy of the Oppressed by Paulo, Paulo Freire. It's essential for reading for any leftist organizer. Yes. Pajama Boy, Tim Poole and other Tulsi supporters are crying over Twitter saying they're manipulating her from trending and replacing it with Assad. They're hands down the worst supporters. Excuse me, Dorothea Day, my bad. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't even know about that one. Did you guys see that Tim Pool raised over a million dollars for his alternative YouTube alt right garbage? Yeah, I know, wow. and people are really uh, four hours. Wow. People are. I mean, look, that's a lot of money, but I mean, what's Tim's take going to be? Probably like two hundred fifty k of that. Like, how many? How much? How big of an operation can that really fund? It's not going to do anything. It's just going to line his pockets for right. another year and a half. Where yeah, we have to listen it's, to his. Crap. That is dumb, dumb money, folks. Certainly, for the first time, made my me money think. stupid. My money, Tim Pool, stupid. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I've, I have to reevaluate my respect level for Tim Pool because I find that pretty goddamn impressive. <laughs> That's amazing. That's awesome, actually. Well, the man with the beanie with a million dollars. Jesus. I was just getting proud of how well TMBS was doing. Could do more Jesse Smollett videos. Right, exactly. 
Uh, Dr. Chaos MD, in a debate when Biden refused to say if he counseled Obama to do less deportations, he refused to reveal what was said in public because he wants to remain vague to people so he can put their own beliefs in what he may or may not have done. If it is, Or is it because he says that he counseled against deportations, but would Obama refute that? I don't know. I don't think Obama. You're not going to hear from Obama. Staying out of it. Going to be with uh, Richard Branson. We've got yeah. a yacht. Going to do some out Richard cannonballs. Branson. By the way, also Donald Trump's total jerk. And no firing squads, okay? Yeah. Keep it simple. No bumps in the road. All right, final call of the day. I'm sorry. Cannot get to any other callers, but we'll take one caller. You're calling from a 716 area code. Who are you? Where are you calling from? Hey, uh, is it me? Yes, it's you. Hey, Michael, how you doing? Uh, This is Jasper. I'm calling from outside of Toronto. Hey, Jasper, what's on your mind? And, uh, so I was just in Detroit. I'm a truck driver, and yeah. I saw some uh, giant billboards, probably funded by the uh, pharmaceutical industry. It was like, uh, hey, presidential candidates, uh, we uh, stopped with the public option. Uh, actually, I was going at 65 miles an hour, so I couldn't really read the whole of it. So it was basically some AstroTurf group advertising on, uh, but giving it some, you know, grassroots name. Mm-hmm calling it uh yeah so this is the kind of shit that's going on as of right now so the attacks are you know bound to get more vicious in future definitely uh, yeah so yeah that's pretty much it i didn't really have anything else on my mind no i appreciate that man uh, man. yeah listening for a few months first time caller i actually tried calling before but i couldn't you know busy everything yeah, of course. And, yeah, uh, yeah. And I, uh, I also wanted to talk about how Jimmy Carter administration actually ruined the trucking in- industry. Yes. For people lots of- like me who recently started. Yeah. So uh, I- I'll have to do some more research and I'll call some other day about it. So, well, thanks. Much appreciated. Bye. Thanks so much for calling. Uh, all right, folks. Yeah. Sorry. Can't get to any more calls. Uh Ooh. Got to try to end somewhat on time. Um, Let me read a few more IMs. MR fan, excellent interview, Mike. Thank you. Um, Let's see. As someone living in her district, I'd like to apologize for Amy Klobuchar. So you, well, Every, everybody from Minnesota should apologize. I used to live for there too, in that big old district. That big old district of Minnesota. I've seen her office in um, Moorhead. Used to be by a pizza place I liked. Um, let's see. All right, the final I am of the day. Trying to look for a good one. Cosmic yawn. Hey, Mike, how do you think the Bernie Dems should handle the general perception out there that government can't do, get anything done? Institutional mistrust is a much bigger hurdle for selling government action than I think folks appreciate. I don't think that's true. I think Trump even went against that in the Republican Party last time. I think people need like realize the need for government to step up with, with all of these health care, climate, all this stuff. I think that keeping it, I think that this is one area where there is actually a very big advantage as many areas, but don't means test, just cancel student debt. Don't muck around, just give everybody health care. Unless you're talking to people who are either, I mean, look, maybe you're talking to a, a handful of super overrepresented, affluent, third way Democrat, Howard Schultz types, and they're quote unquote skeptical of government because they only want government to work for the 1%, right? They have a disproportionate voice in media, but they reflect a tiny part of the population, a very privileged part, but a tiny part. I mean, it's if, AI think tank bullshit. It's AI I think. I mean, if you listen to John Delaney, when he talks about talking to reaching the population, I mean, I'm, I'm honestly like, you're literally talking about like a couple of districts in Connecticut and Westchester. I mean, this is such 
a tiny part of where people are really at. And we have so much evidence in this. I mean, you can even just look at Sherrod Brown holding his seat in Ohio. You think Sherrod Brown gets reelected in Ohio going, walking around the state, talking about why TPP is good for containing China? I mean, it's just delusional. And so, and then, and then yes, then there's some hard right Republicans that have, you know, totally been brainwashed by, you know, Koch brother propaganda on government. But for people who are receptive to a democratic message, and I think where people are rightfully frustrated with government is if you associate government with burdensome, complex public private hybrids, right? If my health care was government delivered, no bullshit, here's your health care. Thank you. I love government. When government, when I have to sit on the exchanges for six hours, I'm not really loving government. I'm appreciating it to the alternative, but it's stressful. It's unpleasant. It's unnecessarily complicated, but that's just to keep unnecessary private insurers in business. You get rid of the private insurers. You give everybody health care, less bureaucracy, more time, better results. So they have I, choice. I'm you, starting to think this is so, not about health care. This is an anti-private sector. This is an anti-private sector. Well, sh definitely when it comes to health care, 100 percent. Bernie's uh, uh, underrated line was when Bernie said, it's not a business, even though you made a lot of money doing it. Beautiful. All right, folks. See you tomorrow. It might take a straight to get to where I want, but I know somehow I'm going to get there. I wasn't looking when I just got caught Between the truth and the light bar But finding out won't make me feel any better Yeah, I know the clock is ticking But the meds are gonna kick in And my pilot light shining bright I get somewhere the choice was where you don't get paid for the road that bends before it finally breaks you. I guess somehow I lost my drive.